I would say it is certainly possible that we would raise funds again at the September meeting if the data warranted. I think the Fed's going to have to be, you know, tighter for longer. The good news we've gotten on inflation recently further emboldens the Fed to actually get to that 2% target. This seems to have been very carefully put together so as not to send a dovish message. I'm not exactly sure why they paused and why they hiked and what they're going to do next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 positive by 0.6%. Meta in the pre-market absolutely flying once again following earnings yesterday afternoon. Looking forward to next week, this time next week, earnings from Apple, from Amazon. We need to still work through this central bank trilogy, the Federal Reserve behind us, the ECB in front of us, and the BOJ. Lisa, just around the corner, should we deal with the Fed first? Back in the saddle with maximum optionality is Mike Gapen's take over at B of A. <laughs> it's a very nice way of saying he said nothing, and he effectively communicated no forward guidance, which is essentially uh, what a lot of people took away from this. Some people calling it a Rorschach test. Basically, they don't know. They don't want to give you any sense of what they're going to do. People are reading this the way they want to read it, and that's how the market is basically moving this morning. And Neil Dutter's read on this over at Renaissance Macro. This is what he had to say. The fact that he sees policy as restrictive, even as growth expectations climb, is dovish. I wonder if Neil is in the camp that Andrew Hollenhorst is in, that the likes of Max Kettner of HSBC is in. Francis Donald and Manulife, just this belief that growth's picking up again, maybe inflation will too. And this raises a question about whether the data that we get out of the U.S. takes on increasing importance, right? I mean, at this point, this is sort of the question mark. If this is a data-dependent Fed, which data are they looking at? And how important is each data point when they say it's just one? So it's sort of this like counterintuitive circular reasoning, which is leaving people kind of questioning what they should be paying attention to. Another read on jobless claims and U.S. GDP a little bit later this morning. We'll do that in a couple of hours' time. Let's just sit on Meta just for a beat. The stock is up by something close to 150% year to date. So going into yesterday, you felt like the bar was kind of high. The stock is up by almost 9% in early trading. Lisa, do you use Reels, this no. short video concept? They have shorts on YouTube as well, and you just sit there doom scrolling for like... <laughs> doom scrolling? For hours. That's what they call it. Like, you know, <laughs> well, doom that, that would be what I do. Through, going through Clearly. video after video. Well, doom scrolling also, because that would be the tenor of the videos that I would gravitate toward, would be the ones Clearly, that, you know, tell the us The algo would the... pick up on it quickly, Absolutely. Brammer. Absolutely. They always do. I, do you use it? I use shorts on, on YouTube. And it's just, you just sit there for it's, ages. It just delivers more and more football content. It's just like, you know, it's just highly repetitive. Again, and it takes again me, this is really an algorithm. No, it knows, it's very it tailored. It takes me back to the 90s and Italian football and you just keep going. Just keep going <laughs> and it appears to get better. And mine just goes to sort of Armageddon projections. But I am wondering whether we end up seeing a, a consolidation and how much of this is going to come from the company formerly known as uh, Twitter, and, and how much they're going to actually gain traction from that if they give some sort of sense of threads going forward. But the bottom line is advertising is really kicking up. And that is a takeaway from companies that have consumer spending that's fueling a lot of profitability. And that is some sort of bigger economic signal. It's hard to get your head around, isn't it? I spoke to an analyst yesterday about Meta, about Facebook, and they said to me, much of the gain so far this year has been off the back of the cost-cutting exercise that started at the back end of last year. I was sitting there thinking, really? That's what this has been. And they said, you wait. We think we're going to get a re-acceleration in ad spend. And maybe you've got some evidence of that overnight. Exactly. And if they're coming off a cost base that is that much lower, it gives them uh, perhaps a little bit more leverage. Again, though, is the cost cutting done? And we heard this from Google as well. They are still looking to pare back expenses, read office space. You hear this from other tech companies as well, even as they lean into artificial intelligence. Are we done with the broad-based, white-collar, cost-cutting job cuts in the tech world that we saw earlier uh, this year and last year? Meta up by more than 8%. As I said a little bit earlier, this time next week, we're going to hear from Apple and hear from Amazon as well. The broader equity market on the S&P 500 futures with a little bit of a lift here. In a green on the S&P, we advanced by 0.5%. Yields are basically unchanged on a 10-year, 387.28. In the FX market, this euro has been all over the place. So I was going through the winning streak, the recent one. So that was the longest winning streak 
for the euro of the year so far. It was replaced by the longest losing streak of the year so far in the last week. And now the euro's back, Lisa, to about 111 going into the ECB. And we do have that ECB uh, rate decision that comes at 8.15 a.m. Eastern, followed by an 8.45 a.m. press conference with Christine Lagarde. Curious to see how they dovetail what you've been talking a lot about, John, which is the fact that core inflation has been sticky. It has been remaining at some of the highest levels ever in the Eurozone's history at the same time that you are seeing growth slow. How they parse that as they raise rates up to 3.75% is going to be key. 8.30 a.m. we get second quarter GDP. We get durable goods orders, initial jobless claims. The expectation is we probably will see very strong growth. How do you then dovetail that into confidence that inflation is going to come down? We have seen the economic surprise index increasingly upward in the U.S. Basically good surprises, meaning the economy is doing better than people expect. How does this dovetail again into the disinflation narrative? And the earnings train continues in the busiest earnings week of the season. I'm focused on Intel. This used to be the biggest chip maker in the U.S. just a couple years ago. It's going to report earnings after the bell. Given the fact that everyone's talking about artificial intelligence, how do they catch up? How do they catch up with AMD, with, uh, NVIDIA. with NVIDIA? How do they try to get on that train at a time where they've really uh, put their stock into personal computing, which hasn't really done that well? No, that's been struggling for a long, long time. Hasn't it? Those earnings coming up a little bit later. Let's turn to the broader market then. The S&P 500 nicely positive this morning by 0.5 percent. Marvin Lowe kicking off the program with us this morning, the senior global macro strategist over at State Street. Marvin, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Lita and I were talking about what Neil Dutta has to say over at Nason's Macro, who basically said the fact you've got a chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, calling policy restrictive at a time that growth expectations are climbing sounds pretty dovish to him. Does it sound dovish to you? You know what? Um, I think that um, what I got out of the meeting was that uh, certainly the Fed wants to stop if they can. Um, they're not really comfortable uh, doing that at, that at this point. Um, you know, I guess the takeaway that everyone's taking out of this is that every data point is real and we're going to have volatility around that. So we're going to read what we want out of it. But certainly um, I think that they're encouraged by some of the trends. They're just not real comfortable, uh, given that they've been burnt in the past, that those trends are going to continue. Marvin, what evidence is there that policy is restrictive? I mean, certainly, certainly on the um, uh, on the financial side of things, and you know, they're looking at credit. We, you know, we did get a sense that there's continued um, tightening in credit because the FOMC did get the uh, senior loan officer survey before we did. Um, so that that remains in the background, and um, the U.S. is a very much credit-driven um, environment, and it's taking a lot longer. The amount of liquidity and savings is um, making this uh, period of contraction much longer, but that doesn't mean um, that it's not uh, affecting borrowing. And this inverted yield curve, which could go on for quite a bit longer, is just another credit challenge that we have in this country. In less than two and a half hours, we're going to get the GDP reading, which is expected to be fairly strong. Marvin, one of the big takeaways that people aren't really emphasizing is that the Fed no longer sees recession as a base case. Have you yeah. shifted your views at all? I know you've been cautious, feeling like we are headed toward a yeah. downturn. Do you feel like the data is showing a very different story? You know what the data is? The, the data to me is is uh, confirming that just the pace of this cycle is very different than everything that we've seen before. Things are taking longer. Um, the process, the parts of the economy that concern us remain a concern out there. It's just taking a lot longer before we actually see that slowdown in consumer. And other than the consumer, we are seeing uh, some of the strains um, uh, that started evolving earlier this year continue. Right now, you're looking at a situation where markets are rallying on the idea that you see better than expected earnings from the tech giants. You see a resilient consumer. You see a Fed that maybe isn't exactly dovish, but they're not particularly hawkish either. They seem to be on an uncharted path. Do you get more constructive? You know, you do. The momentum, the momentum around this risk trade, uh, you know, ultimately can't be denied. Um, I do see that there is a defensive posture within some of our real money indicators. Kind of having said that, um, the imminence of the recession, which uh, you know we've talked about it a lot, um, in being the longest, most anticipated uh, ramp to a recession continues to, uh, continues to confound people. So you can, um, and there is liquidity support in a market where if kind of those recession concerns get pushed um, out a little further, you can continue to see that money uh, gravitating towards risk. So sure. Marvin, that's the US risk backdrop. Let's talk about Europe, yeah. the ECB, a little bit later on this morning. Just how difficult is the job of President Lagarde at the moment? 
I think it's harder than I think it's harder than um, Powell's job, to be honest with you. Um, I believe that Lagarde would probably want to do what Powell did, uh, but what's churning in the background is a lot more concerning than what uh, what we're seeing in the U.S. Certainly, um, we're debating whether or not a recession is um, imminent here. Um, you know, we've seen economies that are already fallen into technical recession in the U.K., um, and that lending environment is is tight both from a borrowing as well as an availability perspective. Which reasons for some of the whipsaw action that we've seen in the euro? It makes sense, given that on one hand, you might see higher rates, but on the other hand, slower growth. Where do you weigh in on the bouncing around that we've seen of the euro dollar cross, as John was talking about earlier? Yeah, I mean, you know, just kind of looking at what's left in terms of central bank expectations, um, I don't think you're going to get a lot of change on the Fed. So, um, you know, we'll use that as a base case, if you will. Um, you could argue whether or not 40 percent pricing for one more hike is appropriate. You know, until we get into the fall, it probably is. Um, we're going to get probably a bit more movement around the BOE, around the ECB. Um, and if anything, the pattern would be that there's less expectations for hikes. So um, I do think that you wind up with a stronger dollar type of environment just because of those um, differentials and expectations will continue to narrow around where the U.S. is. Marvin, do you think that Christine Lagarde could get away with what Jerome Powell did yesterday, which is basically just repeat the script over and over again in different ways, not even different ways, just repeat the script? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. It, cer it certainly was um, the art of saying nothing for, for about uh, an hour yesterday. Um, it's going to be harder for her because the um, headwinds are much clearer. And when you kind of look at um, some of the parts of the inflation discussion, um, they are absolutely collapsing, particularly on the consumer side of things. We've got online indicators uh, around inflation that give us a sense that, yes, the consumer is really, really struggling. But that oil story is, is so much more important to um uh, to the Eurozone. And we've kind of seen how difficult it is um, when it surges. And, um, you know, lo and behold, we've got oil uh, much higher than we did a, a quarter ago. Marvin, we've got a big move in demand for loans in Europe. The ECB's bank lending survey clearly showing a decline in appetite for those loans. Now, Marvin, I just wonder from your perspective, is that by design for the ECB? By design or has it gone too far too quickly? I, I think it's gone too far too quickly. Um, you know, their, their, their lending environment is, is much less robust kind of as a base case than what we wind up seeing in the U.S. So um, they certainly try to control it a bit more than what we see here where there's that kind of natural demand. So when you see it fall off as aggressively um, as it has, it is the long and variable lags in policy, if you will, making their way uh, and making themselves known quite quickly. Marvin Lowe, State Street. Marvin, thank you. On the latest from the Fed, looking ahead to the ECB, the European Central Bank decision about two hours away. I think an accurate summary of part of our programme yesterday, an hour of Chairman Powell saying basically nothing. <laughs> Which we witnessed firsthand. Right? You know, yeah. happens sometimes. I think that was the goal. That was by design for the chairman. And a lot of people said, good job. Steve Shiverone came out and he said, finally, you say nothing. This is what we wanted from you all this time. There were no gaps. There were no mistakes. And that seems to be the theme. Now the question is, how do we read the data? I um, mean, really? I would have wrapped up that news conference earlier, 30 minutes earlier. He was trying just to. get out of there. Well, I mean, it, there's a question as a reporter, do you just stop asking? Or do you say, like, I know you're not going to answer this. Well, the reporters kept going back and forth about September, September, September. And it was just like at some point, you just got to let this drop. The reporters should have left. They should have gone home. <laughs> they should have vacation. just gone on vacation. Reconvened at Jackson Hole. It's an interesting one emerging with the ECB, and we'll talk about that through this morning. But also for the BOE, the Bank of England's a week today. And we've got these advisors to the Chancellor, this newly formed board in the last 18 months or so, last 12 months. And they're basically coming out, according to our reporting, and saying they're worried about the Bank of England going too far. You and I are going to talk about this later. What's interesting about this is that some of the advisors to the Chancellor are former BOE officials, including the former chief economist Andy Haldane. So it's interesting that they're saying hit pause at a time the BOE is set to do anything but next week. Especially because they were in charge of getting to where it was now. Right. So it's a little bit rich. I imagine some people on the board are thinking the same. It's pretty interesting stuff. Intriguing. Do you really want the advisors to the Chancellor weighing in in the way that they might be it's at dissent. the moment. Robust discussion. That's the dissent. That's where you can find yeah, dissent exactly. right now. <laughs> okay. Equity Futures on the S&P Positive from New York. Good morning.
the staff now has uh, a noticeable slowdown in growth starting late, uh, later this year in the forecast, but given the resilience of the economy recently, they are no longer forecasting a recession. We'd be comfortable cutting rates when we're comfortable cutting rates, and that won't be this year, I don't think. It's really a question of how do you balance the two risks, the risk of doing too much or doing too little. I would say it is certainly possible that we would raise funds again at the September meeting if the data warranted, and I would also say it's possible that we would choose to hold steady at that meeting. The art of saying something but saying absolutely nothing at the same time. Chairman Powell. The Federal Reserve Chair in the news conference following a 25 basis point rate hike from the FOMC yesterday. The reviews are in for our Federal Reserve special. This from a Bloomberg subscriber. Were you watching F1 videos and football highlights during the Fed meeting? It sounded like it. That's from a Bloomberg subscriber <laughs> just months ago. <laughs> well, I mean, somewhat, yeah. somewhat accurate. So I was about to say, uh, I guess everyone had their own poison to keep them awake during that. I mean, I will just say it was the unanimous read from the meeting, which sure. is that this was, as, as, uh, as we heard from one commentator, the least informative Fed meeting we've heard since at least 2011, if not, or 2022, uh, if not earlier than that. So we looked at a meeting by meeting giving of some sort of forward guidance and suddenly that evaporated. And by the way, the fact that I may or may not have been doing that is a compliment to the chairman who clearly wanted to make that news conference boring and he was successful. That's brilliant, John. Okay. Seriously, this is a, it's a, compliment, it's a compliment to it's you. It's a compliment to me and to the I'm Fed chair. That. Okay. Mm. Mm. The <laughs> Federal Reserve decision behind us, the ECB just in front of us. Going into it, here are the scores on the S&P 500. Futures positive by 0.5% on the S&P. Yields just about unchanged as you wake up this morning. Your 10-year, 3.86.89. In the FX market, the euro stronger against the weaker dollar. 111 50. We have to turn to Washington, D.C., and not for the news conference from Chairman Powell, but for a press briefing from Senator Mitch McConnell. Really worrying stuff yesterday, Lisa, for the ageing senator, who appeared to just abruptly freeze while speaking and stand in place for the best part of 20 seconds in a news conference on Capitol Hill. He tried to joke about it afterwards, saying he was sandbagged and sort of joking about the lapses. But there's been a very serious concern in Washington, D.C. about his role, especially since uh, he was removed and he was off duty since March. He had a concussion at one point. He's fallen a couple times. But it raises a bigger issue. If we're talking about the age of our elected officials so greatly to ask about whether they are fit to serve, what does that mean in terms of the political cycle and the average age of the elected officials of this nation? It's a pretty humorous response because when he said that he'd been sandbagged, he said that that's what he told the president. Of course, the president tripped over on the sandbag, do you remember? And he said <laughs> that he was sandbagged. But I'm with you. This is really serious stuff. I think the average age of the Senate at the moment is in the mid-60s, something like that. There are some people that have approached 90. I think Diane Fancy to Einstein is 90 now. There are some big concerns around that individual and others too. And this really shapes the conversation a little bit more around the presidential campaign going into next year. And Senator Mitch McConnell is the longest serving leader this is one of the Four issues. Decades. Exactly. And he's been, you know, really consolidating his power. Now we have a president who's around the same age. He's just a year younger than Mitch McConnell. And it's a really delicate issue because that shouldn't necessarily disqualify someone. And yet it has been in the news. And you have raised the question, when do people start talking about it? more seriously, more consistently from the Democratic Party side to decide who's going to step in at that point. Well, I think the press has a role to play in that as well. And you know how the press works in the United States. There's a fear of talking about this. It becomes partisan really, really quickly. But I don't think this has to be partisan politics. You agree. can see this playing out on both sides of the aisle. We saw it happen with the Republican yesterday. And we need to be open and honest about what we see on a screen. When you see an elected official speaking and struggling to get their words out, that's a conversation we need to have. But I think we need to be somewhat careful about putting everyone in the same bucket, that once you get into the 80s, you're done. We know some really sharp people in their 80s. You've talked about your father who's still playing tennis in Central Park. And for anyone that doesn't know, Bramo's dad, <laughs> still absolutely crushing it. But Lisa, look at Bernie Sanders. He's still pretty sharp. Yeah. You know, Chuck Grassley through much of his 80s, pretty sharp. Not everyone is at that same moment when they get to 80 that we have to say, well, they shouldn't be in office anymore. But some more than others, it's obvious they are struggling. And we need to have an open and transparent conversation about it. 
Brilliantly said. I couldn't agree more. And it's something that people have to be able to vocalize without being called out as partisan hacks. John Lieber joins us now, Managing Director of the United States at Eurasia Group. John, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to start there. Some worrying images on Capitol Hill yesterday. It's not the first time we've seen that kind of thing. John, I just wondered what you were thinking yesterday afternoon. Yeah, I mean, my uh, wishes are for the senator's best health. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity that he gave me when I worked for him, and I think he's been a terrific leader for the Republicans in the Senate. Um, but it, it's hard to watch. I mean, it, it really was a, a challenging moment for everybody who's got any affection for Mitch McConnell and anybody that thinks about, you know, the future of this country and its, and its leadership. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we do have a lot of folks. Americans are living longer than ever. They're sharper. Their mental acuity is better, longer than it has ever been before. A lot of them are staying in office as a result of that. And as you said, many of them are doing great. You mentioned Chuck Grassley. Uh, Richard Shelby was an older senator who retired last year. But then along with that, you also have folks like Dianne Feinstein, who is clearly struggling to, uh, has been clearly struggling to do the job that, that she's meant to do. And then there's instances like people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who stayed in office probably a little bit too long in the Supreme Court, and it cost the Democrats a, a Supreme Court seat that they're going to pay the price for for a very long time. So there's there's really no way to force force folks like this out of office. We don't have term limits here, and it absolutely is going to be an issue in the presidential election, particularly if we have two of the oldest people ever to run for the office competing on both the Democrat and the Republican side next year in Donald Trump and Joe Biden. John really framed it wonderfully because it isn't just a partisan issue. It's on both sides. And this isn't a matter of just age. It's also condition and being an honest, uh, having an honest discussion around it. How much of the average age, though, has alienated younger voters and created many more of them, uh, caused many more of them to vote as independent and not necessarily follow along on the same kind of traditional party lines? I would say we haven't really seen that phenomenon. I mean, the, the important thing to keep in mind here is that these are all elected officials who are winning. So voters are telling us that they're actually quite comfortable with the average age of American elected officials going up. If you look at heads of state globally, actually, that's gone down. The average age has gone down nation uh, worldwide. But in the U.S., it's gone up recently with a few outliers like Barack Obama, who were relatively younger. And, you know, look, we had record turnout in 2020 for the two oldest, two of the oldest candidates in American history. And we're probably going to have record turnout again in 2024 with both candidates, uh, you know, bringing up, bring, bringing out the base on both sides. So the, the voters aren't telling us yet that age is a problem relative to what they seem to value in you know, name recognition and experience. John, the campaigning really picks up next month is the first debates for the Republicans going into the primaries, hosted by Fox, the back end of August. There's still a question mark about President Trump's, former President Trump's participation in that, John. I just wonder your thoughts at the moment on his standing and whether he turns up four weeks from now. I think it's going to be hard for Trump to turn down the opportunity to do what he does best, which is push people around on the debate stage. And I think that the debates in 2016 are really where he distinguished himself from the field. He doesn't need to do, to do that this time around. He's got a very commanding lead in the polls. He's got universal name recognition. And even if he's not there, the subject of the Republican debates is probably going to be him and his policies and how the other Republicans try to differentiate themselves from him. So I'm not really sure it matters for his campaign, whether or not he shows up. It is the best opportunity for those other Republicans to try to differentiate themselves from him and take him down a notch, something that none of them have been able to do. But former Governor Chris Christie from New Jersey has said is his explicit goal. So the debates are gonna be massively entertaining. I hope he shows up because I'm definitely gonna watch if he's there. And it yeah. probably is going to be a little bit less interesting without him. But I don't think he needs it in order to stay on top of the Republican field uh, until Iowa. I think most people feel the same. <laughs> they hope he shows up, but ultimately <laughs> think that he won't. It's John, wonderful. It is great TV. I agree with you. John Lieber there of Eurasia Group. John, let's catch up again soon. And thank you for your thoughts on Mitch McConnell. And we wish the Senator the best. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Equities are just about positive on the S&P. Up nicely. Janet Henry of HSBC coming up. Approaching the ECB decision, 
an hour or so away after the Federal Reserve. Your market looks like this on the S&P 500. Snapped a three-day winning streak on the S&P yesterday, going absolutely nowhere at the close. Slightly negative on the S&P this morning. Positive by 0.6%. Big lift for the Nasdaq, up by 1.2% on the Nasdaq 100. Meta in the pre-market, higher by almost 9%. Adding some weight to a monster rally so far in 2023. This time next week on the Nasdaq 100, 17% of the index across two names, Apple and Amazon, after the close next Thursday. Look out for that. In a bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, shaping up as follows. Your two-year yield down by a couple of basis points, 482 67. I have to admit, Lisa, you can create your own narrative following Chairman Powell yesterday, but two years not done much at all, has it? People basically saying that he kept the status quo by saying absolutely nothing. It seems like there is a view maybe on the margins. This was hawkish because the Fed did remove their projection for recession. But otherwise, they're meeting to meet a meeting. They're data dependent with an unclear version of which data they're looking at. A lot of people saying that was the last rate hike. I'm with Neil Dutta over at Renaissance Macro. If you think the profile for growth has improved, but you still think we're restrictive, then that's pretty good news for risk assets, isn't it? If that is some sort of theory that they're following, did you get conviction that that was the case? I didn't get conviction about anything. <laughs> exactly. There you the go. And I think that was the intention. That was the intention. Let's get to the FX market. The euro squeezing out a second day of strength on the euro against the dollar. 111.46, reclaiming a 111 handle. Positive here by 0.55%. Under surveillance this morning, it is the ECB rate decision due at 8.15 Eastern time. So an hour and 45 minutes from now. The announcement coming after the Fed raised interest rates by 25 basis points and left open the possibility of more hikes still to come. Japan just around the corner, BOJ tomorrow. This time next week, it's the BOE. This is a story that we've been talking about here at Bloomberg. Advisors to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, worrying that the Bank of England risks raising interest rates too much and potentially pushing the economy into recession. I was going through the body of the story, Bramo, and there's this worry... They appear to be worrying that the central bank will feel public pressure to continue tightening because they were so late to begin when they started this hiking cycle back in December 2021, which would force them maybe to go too far. It highlights to me how different people become when they shift from a policy role to a political role, right? I mean, this is something we have seen in the U.S. as well, where in the political role, you're more concerned about recession. That's the preeminent concern. And when you're on the committee, it's inflation. And that is the bias in either direction. At this point, their concern could be said around the world. But again, it's the emphasis around the political versus the monetary policymaker. I should share the statement from the Treasury that the Economic Advisory Council provides independent expert advice on economic policy to help grow the economy. Their views do not reflect the views of the government. Mm. This last line here, monetary policy is the responsibility of the Independent Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England. Mm. I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, <laughs> sometimes it might be beneficial if you have this board of economic advisors mm. that do that work for you sort of, you know, through the back door. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you could say that I'm wrong and that it's not politically motivated, but other people might suggest that your view does get uh, slightly shifted when you are advising a political party. Whether it is or it isn't, if the optics start to lean in that direction, I believe that's problematic. That's going to be a big issue in the U.S. as well, the independence of a central bank at a time when there isn't a lot of data, there isn't a lot of clarity in terms of where inflation is going next. Bank of England this time next week, ECB just around a corner. We need to talk about some single names. Meta in the pre-market, absolutely flying, climbing after reporting revenue and a forecast that beat estimates. The stock is up by almost 9% right now. The social networking giant betting on this thing called Reels, a short-form video series that completes with what users see on TikTok to draw attention to Facebook and Instagram. I'm looking forward to this conversation a little bit later on Bloomberg Technology at 12.30 Eastern Time. An interview with Susan Lee, the Meta CFO. That conversation, Lisa, just around the corner. This stock performed tremendously well year to date. And we had some more weight to that this morning. Meta has done a great job of copying successful social media platforms. Right. I mean, essentially, that is what we have seen consistently, whether it's TikTok or whether now it's the company formerly known as Twitter, which I cannot continue to say. Uh, but I'm not going to call it X. X. I, I'm sorry. I cannot do it. I well, just can't bring with myself X to that. The problem is that no one knows what you're talking about still. I mean, honestly, this is the, the, the artist formerly known as Prince. It's basically right. the same thing. So anyway, I am looking forward to understanding whether people really do lean into this, hold their nose and buy, even after the rally that we've seen, given the performance 
performance that we've seen so consistently with the big tech names. Stock up by close to 9%. Phenomenal performance. Concerning performance yesterday on Capitol Hill. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell abruptly stopped speaking and froze in place for what felt like something like 20 seconds at a news conference, a briefing with reporters. There are real concerns about the 81-year-old's health. Hours later, the senator spoke to reporters, tried to reassure them a little bit, Lisa, with this quote. We talked about this earlier. The president called to check up on me and I told him I got sandbag, which I assume is a bit of humour alluding to what happened to the president when he tripped up a month or so ago. Look, we all feel for Mitch McConnell. That is an embarrassing moment and one that really does raise questions about his health. And you heard that in comments, even from the other side of the aisle, whether it's Chuck Schumer or others. They want to make sure he's okay. But underneath those comments is a question about honestly assessing health at advanced ages at a time when, as we were talking about just moments ago, the U.S. representative body is getting a lot older. And the rest of the world seems to be going in a different exactly. direction. You know, I thought Tom might be here and he'd ask the obvious question. Is it like this in the U.K.? And I was going to have the numbers ready for him. <laughs> well, Average bad. age of parliament something like 50. Yeah. And in the United States, in the Senate, it's the 60s and going in the wrong direction and getting higher. It's in the mid-60s or something like that. Rishi Sunak's in his early 40s. And the president of the United States is in its early 80s. We've seen this across the board. And at what point does the U.S. shift? And at what point do voters start pushing back? John Lieber suggesting they're not at all. And they're actually consolidating around the no name, which is ta taking priority over younger blood. Does that shift at some point? Is there a pivotal moment akin to some of the things we've recently been seeing? Concerning stuff from both sides of the aisle. An aging, an aging population, Lisa, and an Asian Senate in a monster way. Let's head over to London and catch up on a central banking story. Janet Henry, Global Chief Economist at HSBC, joins us now. Janet, don't worry, we're not going to talk about the Senate and Capitol Hill and Washington, D.C. We'll talk about the European Central Bank and President Lagarde. What are you and the team looking for from the ECB chief a little bit later this morning? Well, as you say, it's what we hear from the chief. Um, no one's going to be surprised, seemingly, by the rate decision today. It's all about the policy guidance, um, if there is any, um, for September. Uh, and so I think, you know, the first point will be, what do we hear in the statements? Do they change the statements rather than bringing rates to restrictive? Will it be stay um, at restrictive? I'd actually be surprised if there's any change in this statement because then you have a half an hour gap um, before the press conference um, and they really don't want to trigger any significant market volatility in that intervening period. But I fear it won't be any more exciting than the Fed meeting was um, yesterday. At least yesterday, um, they changed the description of first half growth from <laughs> modest to moderate. So we're a little bit more upbeat. Um, for the ECB, actually, the last couple of months have been some pretty ugly surveys um, on the manufacturing side. But I think it will be very much stating the fact that it's all about inflation still. And inflation, while finally moving at least a little bit in the right direction, is still stubbornly high. I don't think they want to change expectations here. And, and they want to still think there's more than less likelihood of a further rate rise in September. That was the promo for the ECB decision a little bit later. A snoozer like yesterday. Janet, I don't think the data is a snooze at all. And I know you don't either. You've got Germany in recession. You talked about the survey data, which was terrible. And you've got a situation where inflation is still sticky. What is the relationship at the moment between growth and inflation in the eurozone? Well, we've got to remember the relationship is never perfect on a monthly basis. And this is also the issue for central banks when they're saying we're data dependent. And yet most analysis would say that a change in interest rates impacts on the economy over 12 months or more, and yet we're going to set policy on what happens to data over the course of the next couple of months. So inflation um, is, is too high, and given the labour market rigidities in the Eurozone, um, they know that once it does get built into wage pressures and the extent to which wages are linked to past inflation, it's much more difficult to, to squeeze out. So a lot of what they're trying to do with policy is to influence um, expectations and not leave anyone in any 
doubt about their intention to to curb um, inflation. So I don't think we, you know, we, I suppose the softening in the data has been more worrying than have been anticipated. And now it's not just about Germany. We've seen a little bit in the service sector, and we've even seen some softening in the service sector data from from some of the other big four economies that have been somewhat more resilient, but not really enough to stay their hand at this point. It will depend on what they see in the next couple of months. And for me, inflation is still going to be above 5% for both headline and core. Um, the, the reason to pause comes after September, where we still think they will be raising rates. Yesterday, uh, one of the reporters in the room asked Chair Powell how much of the inflation that we're seeing in the U.S. really it can be controlled with interest rates the way that it has in the past. I would ask that of the ECB as well. If they do raise rates and continue to hold them at a high level, how much control do they have over bringing down inflation that has remained stubbornly sticky, even with the decline in loan growth? Well, what you have in, in both economies, actually, is, is parts of the economy are definitely feeling the strain from higher interest rates. Um, we know that. Um, but we know that while well, some households and a lot of companies um, are feeling that strain and will continue to do so as those rate rises feed through, there are other parts of the economy that are feeling less strain. And certainly we see that in the US because um, inflation at 3% means real wages are now positive. So you're seeing consumer confidence improve to some degree. And we've actually seen growth hold up um, better um, than expected. So in many ways, the, the way in which they're, they're using policy is to signal their determination um, to, to bring inflation back towards target. And for a central bank where their goal is, is price stability, they are explicit um, in that inflationary goal, um, that's what they need to meet irrespective of what it means for the economy. And of course, for, for unemployment. I think you know both central banks, you know, they don't necessarily always say it explicitly, but they know that they are not going to return inflation uh, firmly on a path back towards target without some significant rise in unemployment. And the Fed has obviously seen a lot more progress on the wage growth numbers than the Eurozone has. The wage numbers are still significantly higher than the US. Um, and so that's why I think they're, they're likely to have to go further than the Fed. Given that the ECB is going to probably raise rates and keep them high for longer, how vulnerable is the euro region to another bout of concern around the price of oil, around the price of natural gas heading into winter and even during this really hot period during the, during, during the summer? Um, yes, they, they escaped um, the, the impact of the full energy crisis because of a warm winter, um, but now a very hot summer um, could certainly mean that they take the toll um, as well. So um, gas prices, um, you know, I suppose, are no longer falling. Um, and um, they are, though, in terms of storage levels, still at quite, um, quite high levels. Um, so that is important. It's not just you know whether the spot price is actually um, moving up. Um, but Eurozone consumers do seem to be more sensitive um, to the fact that other areas of inflation are still higher as well. They haven't seen the same degree of goods price deflation that the US has seen. They've seen an acceleration in service sector inflation. And we know that food prices, while well, wholesale prices have fallen back, um, actually we haven't seen that for processed foods. And we also know that that potentially is going to be another area of, of volatility. So the broad story and a number of ECB members have focused on core and the idea that core is still above five and they can't relax at least until it falls below that 5% level, which certainly we don't expect them to have any sign of by the time of the September meeting. I think all of that matters. It's not just that the gas price and the, and the energy story, um, but other areas of commodity prices matter as well. Janet, thank you. As always, Janet Henry there of HSBC going into that ECB decision 90 minutes away. Inflation's at 5.5%. I have to say, I never thought they'd be able to hike 400 basis points at the ECB. I thought they'd struggle to hike again at one point in the pandemic. And here we are with the deposit rate set to go to 375 a little bit later. Nobody thought they were, they'd be able to get off negative rate policies nope. without causing a massive debt crisis. And yet here we are. It's amazing just how fast this bond market in Italy and Spain and elsewhere has transitioned to the reality of 4% interest rates at the ECB. From New York City this morning, this is Bloomberg.
what we saw from Microsoft and Google just further confirms what we saw from NVIDIA. I mean, the use cases are exploding across the board. And if you, I look at this as a 1995 moment, biggest transformation that we've seen in tech in 30 years. And I think that's why th this is just what's gonna lead, obviously despite Fed and macro, it's the start of a new tech bull market in my opinion. Dan Ives of Wed Bush, bullish and right to be this year. Last year was a big struggle, but 2023, just wow. Meta up by close to 150% year to date before these earnings. After them, we're gonna go through that level. Meta right now is up by close to 9% in the pre-market after beating estimates and providing guidance that there may well be more to come. Mandeep Singh joins us now, Senior Technology Analyst for Bloomberg in Intelligence. Mandeep, just wow, they got it done. And the question I think lots of people are asking at the moment, is that just cost control or are we seeing a reacceleration in revenue growth? I spoke to an analyst later on yesterday who said, we're expecting the latter. Are you seeing the latter? I think so. And uh, look, it's both. Cost control is the primary driver of why the stock has run up so much because the margins are trending in the right direction. But with inflation pulling back, it's good for ad spending. And that's what we saw that, you know, from uh, Alphabet. I think Meta was no exception. The one thing both these companies seem to be doing right is the pivot to AI and how they are using it to improve their ranking and recommendations in terms of the content that are that is being viewed on the apps. And that's what Meta called out yesterday. It's driving engagement in their blue app, which everyone thought was a declining business. Well. It grew, uh, and I think that is what AI can do in terms of driving that content engagement, which is the pull, really, to uh, drive impressions. And, you know, in an ad business, that is what matters. Elisa mentioned earlier that Facebook notoriously is very good at copying other people. Yeah. Cough TikTok <laughs> and Reels. How successful, how sticky has that product become? So one data point they shared last night was Reels is now a $10 billion run rate business versus $3 billion uh, last fall. And that just goes to show three X wow. in a matter of three quarters. I think that just goes to show the point that yes, they are very good at incorporating new features, but I do think it's gonna cannibalize their existing ad inventory, the high priced ad inventory, which is why in the print, the only negative I could find is the ad pricing went down 16%. We saw that from Snap. It was down 12% and we thought it's a social media problem. In this case, they're actually cannibalizing their own ad inventory because Reels doesn't monetize as well as their other formats. Of course, if you own the world and you earn a little bit less off of everything, you're still earning a lot of money. How much are we seeing them consolidate market share for the ad business versus simply just organically growing? In other words, is their gain someone else's loss? Well, so look at messaging. Messaging, no one was able to monetize till now. Now they uh, messaging is a $10 billion run rate business for them, and they talked about incorporating AI agents. So the customer service use case for WhatsApp is huge. Again, we are still very early on, but the fact that they're talking about running digital storefronts who can do their customer service through WhatsApp AI agents, I mean, the market gets excited with these kind of things. And Can I just tell you, John, I get really frustrated when you go to a website and then you look for a phone number and there is no phone number. They're just chatbots. And then you discuss with the chatbot and they help you not at all. I don't speak to the automated chatbots. Well, but then you can't find a to. phone number so frequently. I you will say. You can find their WhatsApp channel now and you can talk to that channel. That's what they're trying to do with their... Uh... Is it a real person there, though? No. No, no of yes. course not. I, that's, I've got no time for that, Mandy. I want to speak to people. I, I totally machines. agree. I absolutely hear you. I am curious. Uh, with respect to Meta going forward, how much of their earnings had to do with crushing it on the advertising revenue and how much had to do with the job cuts? I mean, job cuts was a big factor, 25% layoffs. So they've already reduced their expenses six to seven billion and that shows up in the free cash flow. And they didn't cut anything on the Reality Lab side. That was the big surprise. They talked about raising uh, their expenses on the Reality Labs front. So they, they're still gonna lose 15 billion on building this metaverse again this year. And that's why the stock is not up more. Otherwise, I, I think uh, investors would have cheered this print even more. So if you still think that deep down, Mark Zuckerberg's big hopes and dreams are the metaverse still? Oh, absolutely. That was evident on the call. Like he firmly believes in this. He thinks this will still drive the next leg of growth. But at the time, he's his course corrected, pivoted to AI, rightly so. And that's been uh, good for the Can stock. Can you describe it? What does he have in mind? What does he think this is going to look like? 
Well, so he thinks once he has the install base and he's very focused on building the hardware where you know he can have the content and control that ecosystem. He called out Apple for thwarting you know, their innovation and changing the rules all of a sudden, which hurt $10 billion of revenue last year for Meta. And I think he wants to control that ecosystem. But with Apple Vision Pro launch, I think at least it has validated the market. I still think they are ex uh, spending way too much without really establishing a business case for Metaverse. I, I don't think it's going to be that next computing platform that he thinks. It's probably too far out of bet and losing $15 billion every year. I mean, investors won't like it. Is but at the same time, he's growing top line 20%, so you may get a pass for at least a to three quarters. Is he investing enough on the other tech innovations, in particular artificial intelligence, as he tries to lean into the metaverse with dubious application and, frankly, a dubious leg up on some of the other areas, the other companies that are developing this? Yeah, so uh, they are open sourcing their large language model, unlike ChatGPT or, you know, some of the other ones. And what they're saying is, since they don't have a public cloud, they're going to partner with Microsoft and really make that available for consumption. So it's a good way to go about, you know, driving adoption. But I still think, uh, you know, with large language models and how they're going to be monetized, I think public cloud vendors are the best position, which is why Microsoft and Alphabet got a bump from that. As John was talking about, in about a week's time after the bell, we're going to hear from Apple, from Amazon. Is the expectation that they'll similarly deliver the better than expected results that we've seen from most of the other uh, tech giants, uh, Snap not included, is this basically a telltale sign that the rally has been justified by fundamentals? I mean, in the case of Amazon, you could see ad spending getting a lift because uh, overall ad spending has improved. But AWS, I, I think because of their lack of exposure to generative AI, and the expectations are low, you're going to see a muted growth on that front. And Apple, look, we saw that from TSMC print. Smartphone demand is down. So I can't see how Apple beats uh, on the top line. But at the same time, they still control the ecosystem, which Mark Zuckerberg uh, doesn't like. And I think that's why uh, <laughs> they are where they are. Apple earnings a week away, based on our reporting. Maybe units this year are stable. Don't change much from last year, but average selling prices are going to go up. That's the hope anyway. <laughs> the hope for who? I imagine it I was about to say, the hope well, for the hope shareholders. For them and anyone who holds <laughs> the stock. Exactly, and not the moment, for anyone who's going Mine's a few years old and I'm not upgrading it. Unless they do that thing they do where they sort of press those buttons and come in and slow it down aggressively and then I've got to upgrade it. But right now I want nothing to do with it. I understand. What am I upgrading to? Better. Maybe you can run your large language model on your phone. <laughs> large no, language no interest, model. No interest in that at all right now. <laughs> well, I, I I'm a late you. adopter. I know on pretty much everything when it comes to technology. I think that a lot of people were expecting that people wouldn't upgrade their phones as rapidly as the price went up, and they've been proven wrong every single time. Now, you've raised this. How much was that buy now, pay later? And how much was that fueled by some of the uh, the uh, the AT&Ts of the world, the Verizons of the world, and some of the plans that they had? But, you know, I guess that we'll have to see. Every luxury item on the planet, say every loosely, has been reduced to a monthly payment and not the sticker price. Pretty much everything over the last several years, including luxury, and we've talked about entry-level luxury. I wanted the connection that we've seen, and I know where you're going with this, the drop-off we've seen at Richemont, the drop-off we've seen at LVMH, how connected it is to the buy now, pay later phenomenon that exploded over the previous few years. How many people are able to go to Gucci and say, I want to get this thing that costs 5000 and it's going to be $40 a month, $50, whatever it is. And a lot of people associate Apple iPhones with luxury goods. Now, here's the other question, right? Are iPhones actually increasingly a staple? Because everyone's glued to them. Without and a doubt. it's a computer in your pocket that people use for everything in their life. So this is sort of some of the vagaries around some of the data we've been getting out from a lot of the companies. Mandeep, thank you, sir. It's good to see you. Mandeep Singh there of Bloomberg. This from Dan Ives of Wedbush just moments ago. I came, I saw, I conquered. I'm not sure if Dan's talking about himself <laughs> or if he's talking about the earnings. I suspect he's talking about the earnings so far this week from the likes of Meta and Google. Next week, as we've said repeatedly, Apple and Amazon, the runway through the rest of the year. Just into September. Let's go to September 20th, the next Fed decision. August 4th is payrolls. August 10th is CPI. September 1st is payrolls. September 13th is CPI. Somewhere in between, back end of August, I believe the 24th to the 26th. Jackson Hole. So that's your runway, Lisa, into September. 
can there be any big changes that we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell other than we're still looking at it all, not sure. We'll speak to a former Fed official and find out how boring he thought it was yesterday. <laughs> Rich Claret of the former Fed Vice Chair, now of PIMCO, joins us very shortly. Your equity market positive by 0.5% from New York. Good morning. I would say it is certainly possible that we would raise funds again at the September meeting if the data warranted. I think the Fed's going to have to be, you know, tighter for longer. The good news we've gotten on inflation recently further emboldens the Fed to actually get to that 2% target. This seems to have been very carefully put together so as not to send a dovish message. I'm not exactly sure why they paused and why they hiked and what they're going to do next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Nice and rested after a snooze and nap yesterday around 2.30 Eastern time. <laughs> <laughs> from New York City this morning. Good morning, well good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Chairman Powell and the Federal Reserve decision behind us. In front of us, the European Central Bank decision just around the corner, about an hour and 15 minutes from now. Tomorrow morning, it's on to the BOJ. Right now, this morning, equity futures positive by 0.5% on the S&P 500. Meta in the pre-market, a name we'll talk about a little bit later. Facebook earnings after the close, just tremendous. Adding to the gains we've seen for the year so far. That stock is up by more than 150% now, Lisa, year to day. What a monster gain so far in 2023. And you've asked the right question. At what point do people hold their nose and buy even still, even though they've missed the rally, considering the fact they're delivering and they're delivering above expectations at a time when their footprint is growing and they're consolidating market share. More earnings this time next week from Apple, from Amazon. Meta right now up by close to 9% in early trading. Lisa, the Fed's behind us, the ECB in front of us. The ECB decision is very, very different to what the Federal Reserve is facing right now. We saw yesterday a real lean into the soft landing narrative. We saw a Fed move back from recession as base case. Now it's that we're going to avoid a recession. You're seeing earnings come out stronger than expected. The ECB doesn't have that luxury. They see the data moving in the opposite direction. They see a situation where growth is slowing, inflation is remaining sticky, and they have to communicate something at a time where do they believe in long and variable lags? Do they think that they're going to have some sort of impact if they continue to raise rates? What happened to all the hawkish people recently who've been been saying really dovish things about maybe they don't have to raise again after going to 3.75 percent. The bank lending survey concerning. Yeah. Is that by design or is it happening too quickly? We had a guest, Marvin Lower State Street, who said maybe it's happening too quickly. You mentioned the earnings. HSBC out this morning, just characterizing the earnings out of Europe so far as the most disappointing going back to the first quarter of 2020. You'll remember that. Stateside, you don't see much of that. McDonald's out just moments ago. Sales up by close to 12 percent. The estimate by a little more than... 9%. That's an upside surprise, Bramo, from McDonald's. And we saw the same from Coca-Cola, and we're seeing from a lot of consumer-facing products, in addition to the names like Meta uh, and Google and many of the others. McDonald's shares up as people continue to buy. What I find interesting is it, it's on the lower end and on the higher end, even as we do see some signs of softening around the luxury players. I'm looking at the earnings. They were expected to show an earnings recession. I have heard some people try to poke holes in this earnings season, but the bottom line is the surprises have been to the upside repeatedly, particularly among the biggest, most resili resilient names. McDonald's this morning, a beat on the top and bottom line. The stock is up by 2.4% right now. Let's get to the broader market. Fantastic guest just around the corner. Equity futures at the moment on the S&P 500, Lisa positive by 0.5%. So that ECB rate decision is at 8.15 a.m. We hear from Christine Lagarde at 8.45, the concern being that core inflation remains at about five and a half percent sticky high regardless of how far the fed is uh, how far the ecb i should say has already gone 8 30 a.m we get a slew of economic data second quarter gdp durable goods orders initial jobless claims the data has surprised to the upside of relative to expectations in the u.s is this a good thing well maybe if the fed is leaning into a soft landing and the idea they may not have to hike again and today uh, the earnings flood continues before the bell 
Bell, we get CBRE Group, New York Community Bank Corp, Hertz, Intel and Ford after the Bell. Intel, really key to watch as we talk about the uh, preeminence of artificial intelligence and NVIDIA. They've missed out. This used to be the biggest chip maker. It is no longer. And how much they really talk about resurrecting that role with some sort of push into artificial intelligence. Lisa, thank you. I've been looking forward to this conversation all morning. Richard Clarida, the Global Economic Advisor at PIMCO and former Federal Reserve Vice Chair and a good friend of this program for many, many years. Rich, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. I was thinking back yeah. to our conversation we had on the West Coast when PIMCO put out their secular outlook and you and I talked about what you called the Fed tolerating two-point-something. Did you hear that from Chairman Powell in that news conference yesterday? Because I did. Well, well, yeah, I think that, that you know, they've had a lot to do. They've done a lot of heavy lifting. Um, ultimately, they do want to get inflation to two, but they understand that if a year from now it's running in the twos, that will have been a big accomplishment and they can adjust rates uh, down. They don't, you know, they obviously don't want to tighten uh, too, too much. And so, yes, I think uh, two point something is is kicking uh, and alive for sure right now. Rich, it's worth going over what they're basically telling us explicitly. They're willing to cut interest rates with inflation above 2%. How controversial might that be? I think they'll do a good job explaining it. What they're going to say is, look, as inflation falls, if the Fed doesn't cut rates, it's actually tightening policy because policy is the real rate. So if the nominal rate's unchanged and inflation's falling, they're tightening, and they won't think they need to add additional tightening if they think the inflation momentum's going in the right way. So that's, that's the way that, they will, that they'll uh, explain it. The Fed was talking a lot about data dependency and how they really aren't giving forward guidance at this point. Did you get a sense of which data could really shift their views before September? Even though we do get a slew of data, we've heard yeah. every time them come out and say, one data point a trend does not make. Sure. And I think uh, so they'll have two, they'll have two more inflation uh, prints uh, and two more labor market prints. Uh, but Lisa, I've thought for a long time that another important uh, development that they're going to be following is what's going on in the in the labor market. Um, uh, they they like the fact that the labor market is buoyant, but wages are are going up faster than consistent with the with the two percent target. So I do think they'll be looking at the labor market data, wage em, uh, employment cost index, as well as the the price inflation. So what would they have to see? How high is the threshold for them to hike again in September, or if not in September, in November? I think it's I think it's maybe a closer call than 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 some of the market pricing uh, right now. You know, uh, they did write down uh, uh, two more hikes in June. We got one of them uh, uh, yesterday, and and an overwhelming majority of the committee thought in June that appropriate policy would call for one more uh, hike. So I think certainly one more hike is in play at some point in the fall. You know, the chair said that explicitly. He also said that when he was in Europe a couple of weeks. Uh, ago. So I don't think it's a, an overly high hurdle to get that hike. I don't think they necessarily have to do it uh, in in uh, September. I will say this, whatever hiking they think they need to do, I think they want to get in uh, this year. Why this year, Rich? Why is that important? Well, I think a couple reasons. I think that um, um, I think they think they're close uh, to the end uh, anyway, and inflation's moving uh, however slowly in their direction. And I think they would like to stay out of the spotlight uh, in, in an election uh, year. Now, we've had the Fed hike in election years, 04, 1984, come uh, to mind. And they'll do that if they really think they, that inflation really requires a much higher rate path. But I think this cycle is, is aiming to finish up sometime in the fall. You know that this Fed is always criticized. The committee always faces criticism for something. Some of the criticism yeah. we heard from some guests in the news conference before the news conference and after the news conference too, was just how data dependent this Fed actually is. They took a break from hiking, Rich, then they come back and hike again. And in the intermittent period, we had inflation that actually improved. The inflationary backdrop seemed to get better and yet they hiked yeah. anyway. How data dependent are they? Well, good, good point. Data dependence is a very elastic phrase which has, is open to various interpretations. I think on balance, Really, they, going forward, especially after this meeting yesterday, they, they really are data dependent. As you know, I've said on your air before, most of this rate hike cycle, they've not been that data dependent. In March of last year, they knew two things. The funds rate was at zero and inflation was at five going to six. That's all the data they needed to set off this, this very aggressive rate hike cycle. I do think as we do get close to the terminal rate, that, that at the margin is more uh, data dependent. Although I did, I agree, and I said on, on, on Bloomberg after that meeting, it was, that, it, was a, it was an awkward pause in June, that's for sure.
It's an awkward moment also right now, given that the Fed is removing recession as the base case and we're yeah. looking at a soft landing. And yet there's a real question mark among analysts and a real split among investors about whether inflation could reaccelerate as a result of the strength, the resilience, the wages. Where do you fall on this? What yeah. do you think the Fed falls on this, given that they seem to be taking perhaps a bit more of a dovish stance? Yes, quite, quite. Quite frankly, Lisa, I, I was surprised in the, in the press conference. I wasn't surprised to hear the chair say, as he has many times, that he thinks there's a path to a soft uh, landing. That's OK. Sure, there's a path. And, uh, but I was surprised that he invoked the change in the staff uh, uh, forecast. I don't think that was in the, in the June uh, uh, minutes. And so he's obviously entitled uh, to do that. But yes, not my base case, not our base case, but there is a scenario where we get some good news on inflation this fall because of falling rents, uh, used car prices again falling. Um, but if the Fed finds itself in March of 2024 with an unemployment rate of four and inflation rate of, of, of four, uh, you know, with some of that temporary good news behind them, they're in a very tough spot. So I do think it's a risk. It's not the base case, uh, but it's certainly something if I were still there, I would be I'd be uh, assessing. What do you think right now is the bigger risk, Rich? The idea of inflation reaccelerating and still being a problem, or the idea of recession and avoiding something more entrenched, which could happen if the Fed moves slower? Well, personally, I, I do think that, you know, again, I'm in the private sector now. I, I do think that, that the Fed, the bigger risk is for the Fed is to uh, declare a mission accomplished uh, too early and find themselves next year having to restart the rate hike. So if I were there, it would skew me. Uh, to getting in, you know, that additional hike uh, uh, this year. And I think some members of the committee will, will see it that way. Look, Lisa, the other thing is um, um, the Fed's own projection, which I agree with, has unemployment rate rising by about a point by the end of next year. Uh, that would be very modest. That would probably be the most modest downturn we've had. But historically, as we know, the SOM rule, whenever the unemployment rate rises by more than a half a point, it's ultimately declared a, a recession. So I actually think a truly non-recession outcome without any rise in the unemployment rate at all is going to be is going to be tough. That's my personal view. Would be phenomenal if that materialized. I want to finish on this if we can, Rich. Yeah. No dissents. We talked about this yesterday. I've been talking about it for a while. You've been on the committee. Why do people, even when we know they might disagree with the decision, make the decision not to dissent? Why does that happen on the committee? Well, you know, the Fed has been an institution that's been around for 100 plus years, and there are certain cultural uh, norms. Um, and certainly, it's been a very long time since you've had a governor uh, dissent on a policy rate uh, decision. If you go back to Gr the Volcker years, he had governors and his vice chair dissenting. But, you know, since Greenspan, uh, but the Reserve Bank presidents can and do dissent. Certainly during my time at the, the Fed, especially in 2019, we had three dissents, and we had several presidents saying they would have dissented if they had had a vote. So dissents can happen. The other thing I should note is we've had a lot of turnover um, among the regional bank, uh, district bank presidents, you know, the announcement of Jim Bullard True. recently, Esther George, Est uh, uh, and Charlie Evans, uh, uh, Rosengren. You know, there's accumulated 50 plus years of institutional experience that's no longer uh, in, in that room. I think that's also relevant. Richard, thank you, sir. For weighing in. Thank Let's you. catch up soon. Next time in studio, please. Richard Clarida there, the former Fed Vice Chair and now of PIMCO. If you're just joining the programme, welcome to the programme. The S&P 500 positive this morning by 0.55%. Coming up in about 45 minutes from now, we'll catch up with James Athey of Aberdeen looking ahead to the ECB rate decision about an hour from now. Bramo, most people anticipating a hike from the ECB even with Germany in recession and the data this week looking pretty awful. And you pointed out how earnings have been really disappointing in Europe and how different that is from what we're seeing in the U.S., whether it's McDonald's or, and this just caught my headline, Crocs just upgraded their full year earnings per share, their forecast, and um, evidently Crocs are cool again. And I, I'm wondering how you feel about that, John. I've, I've got no <laughs> idea what's cool anymore based well, on the kind of things that I'm into. Anyway, and the kind just, of things that people are wearing these days. <laughs> I'm just looking at that and I'm thinking, ah, oh, that's going to be a field day of that. But TK your point. would do that. TK's far more fashion forward than I am. Is, is he wearing oh, Crocs? Can goodness. you imagine Crocs. him wearing Crocs? He came in the other day with leopard print Doc Martens. Seriously? I'm serious. That's actually kind of cool. With a beige suit. And next time he does it, I'll take a photo. Um, seriously. And post it online. Uh, and we'll talk about it yes, all day long. Like a guess who?
<laughs> Guess, I don't think... Oh, my shoes versus his shoes. <laughs> well, I think everyone will know who it is. Well, because his shoes are about ten sizes bigger than mine. <laughs> yeah, also you wouldn't wear Guys, leopard print. There's no way. I mean, I mean, come on. No, not if you paid me. <laughs> I mean, like, seriously, not if you paid me. I know. Chair Powell made it very clear in the in the press conference that he doesn't see the need to go that much further. Uh, you know, the very fact that it's sort of meeting by meeting now tells you that he thinks that you know maybe there's one more rate hike, maybe there's no more rate hikes uh, as we go forward. Maybe the hike, maybe they won't. William Dudley, former New York Fed president, went in on that yesterday. Of course, now Bloomberg opinion columnist. Just moments ago, we caught up with the former Fed vice chair, Richard Clarida, who really presented in a very clear way what the Fed is telling us right now, which is that they don't think inflation comes back to 2% until 2025, that you could have this dynamic, which is reasonable, makes sense when you explain it, that you could have this situation where CPI is in the mid-twos and they're reducing interest rates and the hope... I believe the dream of this equity market, and you can tell me whether you think this dream materializes, is that you can achieve that without unemployment spiking aggressively higher and GDP falling off a cliff. It banks on this idea that the disinflation will continue and that we're not going to see a reacceleration of inflation, which is something that a lot of people disagree with, especially because of the strength that's leading the Fed, among many others, to call for a soft landing. Is this inconsistent? Even Rich Clarida, who was formerly on the show just moments ago, said he would err on the side of raising rates one more time in the fall to front load the hikes because of that concern. The data this summer probably won't address this debate. It's the data in the back half of the year. The data this summer most people anticipate will conclude with disinflationary trends coming to the surface. Even the people who think it will reaccelerate expect that this summer. The real test is the back end of the year when we also get student loan repayments resuming as well, Lisa, and most people are writing stories about whether or whether that doesn't hit economic growth in a material way. So how do you engage in data dependency without some sort of driving theory and driving expectation if the data isn't going to show up Mohammed's point, exactly. You've this got to have some theoretical underpinning about what you're doing. You can't be hyper data dependent between meeting to meeting. And based on what we got yesterday, and this is what the complaints were about, and I know you're on board with this, if it really was meeting to meeting, why did they hike this time based on where the inflation data came in? I would agree with that. I also think you have different theories depending on which Fed official, and they're just glossing over that by saying we don't have a theory and we also don't have dissent, or at least there's the appearance of that. And I think we've discussed that. I think it's a valid discussion to be having. The Federal Reserve behind us. Keep talking about the ECB. Really interesting discussion coming up a little bit later this morning. We'll catch up with James Athey of Aberdeen going into that decision. The decision a little under 60 minutes away. The Broader market looks like this on the S&P 500, positive by 0.55% on the S&P. There's a lift in equities, a monster rally in Meta. That stock is up in the pre-market by close to 9%, up by 8.82% this morning, Lisa. Just adding some more weight to the rally for 2023. What is it, 150% at oh, this it's point? It's nuts. It's through that. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. It's through that now, yeah. So then do you buy at this point? Do you say, all right, I'm in? If I speak to analysts at the moment, and you're not going to get my meta call, I'm never <laughs> going to give anyone that. If you speak to analysts at the moment, the bullish ones, they think that a lot of the price appreciation we've seen so far this year is just cost reductions and cost discipline, and that we could see a reacceleration in, in revenue growth. And look, we saw some of, that, some of that yesterday, and the stock is up again this morning. And then you have the Leach Levines of the world who say rates will eventually come down, and you'll get that tailwind on the back end. And this, to me, again, it highlights how wrong everyone has been, considering that people were saying that tech was going to be the biggest loser so far oh, this year. And it's been the big winner in a big way so far in 2023. Joining us now down in Washington, D.C., is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie, our chief Washington correspondent. AMH, we have to start, of course, with some upsetting images from yesterday. Mm. Senator Mitch McConnell, who appeared to freeze in a news conference at a briefing, it's been raising questions about the age of people in the Senate. Of course, not just Senator McConnell, but Dan Feinstein, another one who's really struggling at the moment on the other side of the aisle. How's this playing out, AMH, down in Washington this morning? Well, you're correct, Jonathan. We wish the senator well, but he did essentially freeze. He abruptly, you can see it right there on the screen, stopped speaking for about 20 seconds. He then had to be ushered away. John Barroso there, the senator, asking him, are you okay, Mitch? Anything else to say? Ushered away, but then he came back to the mic and said, I'm fine. And I think in a politically uh, charged moment about 
questions surrounding individuals' age, but it was very astute of Senator McConnell to say that the president called him and he said, I told the president I got sandbagged. So basically also pointing out that, yes, we're all in this boat together, we're of older age, and we do have these moments, but it does raise a question about the older age, the aging elected officials we have. When Dianne Feinstein, the senator from California, came back from recovering from shingles, an L.A. Times reporter had this moment with her asking her how it felt to be back, and she seemed very confused as she had never left. She said, what do you mean? I've been here. I've been voting. So there's been a lot of questions about the age of these elected officials, a lot of questions about Biden and his age as he seeks re-election for 2024. And you look at some of the data, and a lot of Americans actually want to see upper-level age limits on elected officials, but at the same time, a lot of Americans say older individuals have a, are very wise and they should be able to serve if they are healthy, and they should be able to be able to do that if they have the cognitive mentality to do so. Given the uh, voter... Uh, appearance of being okay with older politicians. How do you expect this to play out in terms of voter turnout, in terms of voters pushing back at all in next year's election? Well, we're potentially facing an election where we have these two very old candidates. Biden is 80. You have a president who's in his late, uh, former president who's in his late 70s who's seeking re-election. And poll after poll does show there is concern about Biden's age. Uh, earlier this year, that NBC poll, it was staggering. About 70 percent said Biden shouldn't seek re-election, re and more than 60 percent said they think he is just too old. So this is going to come up. And the issue, really, the Biden camp faces and other elected officials face when you're in your 70s or 80s and potentially you're struggling is what happens in front of a camera? Do you trip? Is there a moment where you have a gaffe? Is there a moment where you freeze on camera? And then the questions start to really rise, and can that derail a campaign? Hey, Mace, just before you go, when you cover a campaign at the moment, traditionally you would just focus on the politics. Unfortunately, we have to focus on the legal issues as well, not just around the president's son, but also around the former president, Donald Trump. What are you expecting to develop yeah. in the coming weeks? There's a lot of legal issues, and there potentially is going to be more in the next 24 hours. So first, for the former president, potentially today, we can get that indictment. Uh, this would be his third indictment this year. This would be from the federal uh, special counsel, Jack Smith. And this would be regarding overturning the election results of 2020 and January 6th. So potentially, that could happen today. What it means for his election race is that he is just going to be bombarded with legal issues alongside the campaign trail. And then, of course, the president's son, current president's son, Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, uh, yesterday had this plea agreement. It broke down in court. Uh, the lawyers from both the prosecution and defense went away, and potentially they will come back to the table with an agreement. Uh, but this just keeps Hunter Biden's name in the press and potentially poses some problems for the current president as he seeks re-election. You're doing some construction over there, <laughs> Anne-Marie. It's above me. It's the floor above Someone's me. I'm not sure what's <laughs> what. Okay. All right. Go well, sort them out. They're building me a new studio for 2024. Very cool, as they should. Amory, thank you. <laughs> AMH down in Washington, D.C. I've got no idea what's happening then. <laughs> Real time. <laughs> wasn't sure if that was AMH sort of banging a table or <laughs> someone, someone hammering through the ceiling. Yeah, exactly. I figured uh, someone was taking off the shoe, their croc, and slamming croc, it on the sure. floor. We should have yeah, talked yeah. about exactly. crocs she has with strong her. feelings. You need a law degree right now to follow politics in Washington, D.C. It's it's nuts. It is crazy, especially when the headlines are coming out every day. So Hunter Biden supposedly had a plea deal that may or may not have fallen apart. We are still waiting, I believe, to find out what the latest on that is uh, and what the negotiations are there. The former President Trump has said that he is going to revive his complaints his allegations of uh, the election being stolen from him. Okay. If uh, there is some sort of prosecution for January 6th uh, situations. I mean, all of this rhetoric kind of taking the oxygen out of the room a little bit of the political debate. The silly season really gets going next month when it gets super quiet in Washington. And that's you, what Yeah, about. you know when it starts to get really crazy. I mean, we're already talking about I, dogs. I know. And I know. I know. Then the campaign picks up and you've got to talk about that for 18 months. Coming up shortly, Chris Morangi of Gabelli Funds on an equity market that's doing pretty well this morning, up by 0.6%. Meta, upside surprise, stock up 9%.
equities this morning and good morning. Positive on the S&P 500. A lift here on the S&P and on the Nasdaq too. We're up by 0.6% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, up by 1.2%. Meta getting it done in more ways than one. Their stock is up by close to 9%. We'll talk about those earnings in just a moment. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, shaping up as follows. Going into the ECB later. Yields lower at the front end of the curve, down by three basis points. 482 on a two-year, on a 10-year. Basically unchanged at 387. Elisa, following the snooze fest yesterday afternoon. Some people called it a Rorschach test, that you could make of it what you wanted, given the fact that they seemed to endorse the idea of a soft landing and endorse the idea that they weren't necessarily going to hike again. At least they weren't on any kind of preset path. We heard from Rich Clarida. He thinks the market is a little too confident they're not going to hike again. I am curious about what the threshold is for deep summer data for them to really shift away and surprise the market with another rate hike. You heard from an official there 30 minutes ago who was burnt, burnt by the inflation story. And I would say Chairman Powell was burnt earlier this year as well when he started to embrace the disinflationary trends that he thought was emerging and then had to back away from that conversation. That's going to shape their approach to this through the summer. Which is true. And that's why some people are saying they could make the opposite mistake by getting too hawkish because they're trying to correct a mistake they made earlier. Underneath all of this, Tom Keene, if you were sitting here, would say it's the pandemic economy, it's the pandemic recovery. Careful it's about channel TK. Okay. But, you know, <laughs> I can wear my leopard shoes. There is going to be an issue going forward. How much do Fed officials buy into the immaculate disinflation that seems to be underpinning the soft landing hopes that we keep hearing from so many economists and Fed officials? But privately, I'm sure they're dancing around hoping and praying. 100%. Publicly, I think they're going to be very reluctant about doing that. Let's turn to the FX market just briefly. Euro stronger for a second session. The euro against the dollar, 111.36, positive here by 0.5%. Under surveillance this morning, an ECB rate decision due at 8.15 a.m. So 45 minutes from now, the announcement coming after the Fed raised rates by 25 basis points left the possibility open of doing more. Meanwhile, in the UK, this one's interesting going into the Bank of England next week. We're reporting that advisors to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, are worrying that the Bank of England risks raising interest rates too much, potentially pushing the economy into recession. So we've got the BOE next week, Lisa, the ECB just around the corner, BOJ tomorrow. BOJ tomorrow is pretty interesting, you know, because out of everyone, out of all these central banks, Federal Reserve, ECB, Bank of England, they view the inflationary uptick as an opportunity. Not a problem, an opportunity to reset inflation expectations. And there are some people talking about possibly abandoning the yield curve control or the peg that they've had. I can't imagine that's going to happen. I personally, Reports suggest it won't tomorrow. I can't imagine that They've it surprised could. before, but Yeah, but it's been a long time. They've been moving in the opposite direction. Will the rest of the world, to your point about the UK, join their view of things? That if you let things take their course and play out, there will be this sort of disinflation. You'll allow yourself to have an economy that isn't destroyed by some sort of deep recession. But we were having the same discussion six months ago. It's super transitory. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, you know, <laughs> exactly. push, push it out. The, push but out we were having line. the same discussion six months ago, particularly of the Bank of England. And then inflation surged higher. And oh, yeah, the economy did better than expected. So at what point do you take that and say, wait a second, we need to pay attention. We're not understanding some influence here that's keeping strength going. And also on the flip side, inflation. It doesn't happen in a straight line. I find the ECB decision today to be pretty confusing. What do you do when growth is really disappointing, but inflation is still a problem? They've got an inflation mandate, 2%. Single mandate. It's unlike the Fed, they don't really have the luxury of backing away anytime soon, which is why most people assume, Lisa, they hike later on this morning. And then how do they guide forward at a time when the hawkish members are starting to say, uh, maybe we should be a little bit more concerned about how much we've already done? That's the central bank talk. Let's briefly talk about some of the earnings this morning. Upside surprise from McDonald's from about 30 minutes ago. Yesterday afternoon, upside surprise from Meta. The stock is up by close to 9%. Everyone's using reels, apparently, Lisa, this short video format that you know well, which is basically just to compete with TikTok. But tech, you've got to say it. Getting it done so far, validating some of the moves based on what we heard from Alphabet and what we heard from Meta overnight. 
Upside surprise after upside surprise, advertising such as Point of Strength, uh, Meta in particular, and we were talking about how they really uh, are good at copying successful technologies and taking advantage of technologies that have some sort of pall cast over them. And this I find interesting. TikTok, the question around Chinese ownership, they get in on reels and can get popular. The company formerly known as X, suddenly a question around Elon Musk's leadership and guide. They start threads and they're cheered for it. At what point do they sort of get a pass because they take advantage of these opportunities of contention in the tech world? You can't stand this X thing, can you? Can you imagine <laughs> if Twitter was reporting earnings, how bad that might look right now I, based on what's yes. happened in the last few quarters? That's the tech story. Just remember Microsoft was a soft spot. I would say the soft spot of the week. Biggest one-day drop on Microsoft stock yesterday, going back to January, I believe. Let's get to this final story. A car carrier with nearly 4,000 vehicles, including BMWs and Mercedes, is burning off the coast of the Netherlands. This fire, we're told, according to the Dutch Coast Guard, could last for days. The vessel, Lisa, listen to this, twice the length of a football field and trying to prevent it from overheating so it doesn't sink and leak fuel. It's just an amazing situation there this and morning. Potentially uh, an ecological disaster. I'm looking at some of the details and they say that still the cause of the fire is unknown. Some pretty horrific images at a time uh, when uh, the car manufacturers are all reporting earnings. So it's a very difficult moment uh, given the fact that a lot of the cars on this ship belong to companies that have been reporting earnings throughout the morning. Mercedes upgrading their outlook yesterday. We talked about that briefly, didn't we? This a year or so ago, can you imagine supply chains and what everyone would be talking about? It's sort of like this will get brushed under yes. under the carpet. But a year or so ago, it's been like, you know, car prices and right then we get into stories totally yeah everything. totally now totally don't stories care. totally change chris morangi joins us now co-cio at gabelli funds chris wonderful to catch up with you sir can we just start with something that i know that you've been doing well with meta chris talk to me about what we heard yesterday did you like what you hear yeah we like what we heard and as is the market apparently so you know we thought that follows a pretty strong report from google and even microsoft which had a very high bar to clear um and you know, we saw some confirmation that uh, users are returning, that advertising is pretty good, spending's under control. Um, they took off, took out some of the overhang of increased capex in 2024. And um, listen, they can possibly earn $20 in 2024, and that makes the stock look pretty cheap here. A lot of people push back against some of the enthusiasm around artificial intelligence and say that the results that have been positive in the tech names have come from the nuts and bolts of their business, advertising, uh, even cloud spend, albeit that was somewhat softer than expected. Are you still leaning into the AI story? Are you, are you looking past that and saying, fundamentally, these companies are still making money and that's why you want to lean in? Yeah, it's, it's, it's early for AI, obviously, to have an impact. And, and Meta got in on the AI story as well. They, they talked about it a bit and they've got a, a little bit of a different approach. We're probably not going to see that play out in earnings for, for some time, but there's a scarcity of ways to play AI. And that's why you've seen names like Microsoft and Google and to a lesser extent Meta uh, really benefit from that story. Uh, AI is going to change the world. Not quite sure how it happens and how we profit from it though. How have you shifted your views or the names that you're really leading into as we do get earnings, as we do get this backdrop of a potential soft landing? Yeah, you, you, you've said it a bunch of times, soft landing. The market sniffed that out sometime in June. Uh, earnings, though, thus far have been pretty confirmatory of that outcome. And I think the market is reflecting that in some of the broadening of uh, performance to the small caps, which tend to be a little bit more cyclical. So we've always had a bias towards smaller companies, less covered companies, industrials. And um, we're, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing a benefit there. And like a lot of those stocks, notwithstanding some of the great performance from companies like Meta and Google. Chris, can you walk me through that decision to buy Meta after the complete mess of the last quarter of 2022 when things started to look really bad for that company? What did you see that you liked at the time? What was the framework, the process that you and the team went through to identify that name as something you should buy? Well, listen, we, we, we've been following the company for a very long time. Uh, we have a core competency in media here and, and Google and, and Meta fall into communication services. They're in many ways, media companies, they, they eat advertising. Uh, but you know, one of the concerns that we've always had was the out of control spending. Um, when they talked about the year of efficiency, we knew that even if we did hit an air pocket in the economy, Google and Meta and others would have a, a, some cushion in being able to reduce their own expense bases to maintain margins, maintain earnings, and, and they've done that. 
Chris, there's a hope now that revenue can reaccelerate. And when people discuss taking cyclical exposure, can you talk to me about taking cyclical exposure in some of these tech names? Yeah, I mean, they are going to be the beneficiary. They are exposed to advertising. More than half of advertising is, is digital, and most of that is controlled by two companies, Meta and Google. And um, they are going to be a beneficiary of a cyclical upturn, maybe to a lesser extent from the uh, tsunami of political spending that's going to happen next year. But core advertising remains soft. We also saw Comcast this morning, which actually put up very good results, although, you know, one of the one of the nicks there was um, advertising, as expected, down about 5% at NBC. Um, so linear television remains a little weak. We're a year over a year into an ad recession there, but that's going to turn around at some point. And by the way, that should benefit Meta and, and Google. Meanwhile, Chris, uh, Gabelli has been really vocal about the need to consolidate your bets around a number of names that you know and have conviction in. How has that played out? How much have you broadened that out versus continued to really focus on a number of key names that really do seem to represent the trend and the strength in the economy right now? Yeah, I mean, always, we've always tried to stick with what we know. And um, there are certain sectors that we just don't play in because they tend to be commoditized or we just don't understand them. But we've got enough that we can understand and we can we can benefit from different uh, dynamics in the economy. You know, there's certainly acyclical or less cyclical components of, say, consumer discretionary, the cable companies, broadband companies that have a sub substantial subscription business, as well as the you know more cyclicals, the, the metal benders that go up and down with the economy. So we've got a pretty diverse uh, portfolio that can take advantage of whatever happens. Chris, when you have a monster winner, whether it's Meta or another tech name, how do you make the decision to, to cut, to move away, to lock in the gains after yeah. a short period of time? What goes into that? Well, you know, we're, we're always looking for a margin of safety. And an ideal case, you know, you've got two lines, you've got your private market, what we call our private market value and the public market value. And if that margin of safety, the gap between those two lines remains consistent with what we'd expect, uh, we're happy to own. We're happy to own forever. We tend to have very low turnover in our portfolios, but if that margin of safety narrows, we'll, we'll trim or, or, or exit. Um, and you know, in the case of Meta, uh, they've been able to grow earnings and the multiple has expanded a, a little bit recently, but um, it's really still an earning, earning story. Well, Chris, wonderful to catch up and congratulations on a wonderful investment so far. Chris Morangi of Cabelli Funds Meta looking better and better as the days roll by. The stock lease are up 9% this morning. You asked the right question. When do you decide to cash in? Right. When do you decide to say this is pretty good at this point? And Chris had a good answer to it. I do wonder, though, at some time you do hear people saying maybe sell on the margins and then shift into some other areas. Cyclicals. Yeah. How much have we heard that? I know. It's like on repeat on for repeat. the last month or so. If you are just tuning into the program, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 right now is positive by 0.6%. It's the countdown to the ECB now, about 30 minutes away from that decision. We'll catch up with PGM Fixed Income's Catherine Nice. Looking forward to that conversation on the European Central Bank. And ultimately, what happens beyond the 25 basis point hike Bramo, we all expect from President Lagarde of the Governing Council in the next 30 minutes or so. And at a certain point, I do wonder, and we discussed this earlier in the show about that loan survey that showed such a steep drop off in loans. And we heard uh, about how it probably was too quick for the ECB's comfort. At what point do they highlight that? in the meeting, that there is signs, there are signs of some serious credit contraction making it difficult for them to really get overly hawkish at this point. Is that what they want to see? I think this is the one for me. You can acknowledge the bank lending survey, but it's how you characterise it. Is it by design? Is that something, the intended consequence of policy? Or is the pace at which it's happening unintended and unwelcome and maybe slightly nerve-wracking for some of them on the committee? Well, Marvin Lowe said that it was too quick. He said that this is not the orderly fashion that they'd like to see. And if that's the case, if they pause and they can see whether it evens out, maybe they'd opt for that kind of thing. But are we past the point where ECB and Fed officials want to communicate hawkishness in order to jawbone the market to some kind of response? That seems to be one of the key questions. Do they care about easing financial conditions? You picked up on the right word, I think. Is it orderly or is it disorderly and we'll find out from the ECB president in the news conference that comes 30 minutes after that decision. A little bit later, a conversation you might not want to miss. Gary Gensler, the SEC chair, is going to be joining Bloomberg at 11 a.m. Eastern time from New York City. This is Bloomberg. There's a, a 
certain uncertainty um, on the side of the customers in terms of inflation, but I personally don't expect a, a recession in, in the next quarters. I expect a small growth, 45% for the automotive industry next year. And this is also true for the major region, mainly US uh, and Europe and China perhaps a little bit lower. That was the VW CFO following earnings a little bit earlier on today. The car earnings so far, Mercedes-Benz raising their outlook just yesterday. Europe at the moment not looking tremendous, let's put it that way. Germany in recession, the PMIs, the survey data you get on things like manufacturing and services. We got that earlier this week and the data didn't look great at all. But the ECB still has an inflation problem. Inflation, core inflation still has a five handle and the ECB wants to get that down to two. So most people believe they're going to hike interest rates a little bit later in about 30 minutes from now. Another 25 basis points. Joining us, I'm pleased to say, is Catherine Nice of PGM Fixed Income, who writes the following. It seems too soon for the ECB to declare the job is done in terms of bringing inflation back to target. And so we expect a hawkish tone coupled with language that keeps all avenues open for September and beyond. Catherine, I'm pleased to say joins us now. Catherine, wonderful to catch up with you. Let's start with this ECB decision. 25 basis points in 25 minutes is what most people anticipate. How difficult does this decision become as the growth backdrop starts to look worse and worse? It's going to be hard for the ECB to, to thread the needle. They've got to acknowledge that the euro area economy is weakening. You mentioned uh, some of those recent data coming in. Uh, some of them have been weakening, you know, quite, quite markedly. Uh, and yet the backdrop is that inflation remains uncomfortably high. You know, if I compare the euro area to the U.S., we're just not seeing that consistent, compelling message uh, coming from the data that near term inflationary trends are, are dropping off. So for them, they're going to need to try to strike a balance between keeping their options open in September without sounding overly dovish. Tricky balance. Especially at a time when we're hearing some confusing rhetoric out of previously Uber hawks on the board. How much has that colored your view in terms of confusing the message a little bit at a time when inflation clearly is the preeminent concern for central bank uh, bankers whose mandate is exactly getting price stability. Well, I think it's a signal that the central bank is is getting near to, to peak rates. So whether or not they raise rates in September, uh, again, uh, like others, and you mentioned it earlier, I, I expect the ECB to raise 25 basis points today. That's pretty much what they've told us to do. But whether they do so again in September, I think stepping back, big picture is that we are near peak rate based on what we're seeing from the, the data now, uh, but that the ECB is likely to hold rates at these higher levels for quite some time. So perhaps it's that that pivot point um, that's being reflected in, in, in some of these uh, the change in tone in some of the comments that you mentioned. We were talking about this, about how the loan survey showing the steepest drop off in decades in terms of loan creation in the euro region is potentially a problem for an ECB that would like to see an orderly credit tightening. How do you expect them to frame this? How do you view this as affecting the European economy? Uh, I expect that this is going to be a key data point that is going to inform their uh, decision today. Uh, that's what the chief economist had mentioned, you know, in previous communications, and, and it is a key input. It's telling us whether or not the transmission mechanism is working, and these data certainly do suggest that it is working. Um, you know, if, if, if we just do a mechanical backing out of the PMIs, which are generally speaking a pretty good indicator, a near-term indicator of economic activity for the euro area, we're looking at a euro area that is effectively stagnating. Um, that's one thing. But is this potentially the beginning of a steeper and, and more marked contraction? And I think that's going to be the question mark over this ECB bank lending service survey that you mentioned, that, of course, would be a concern. It's not the base case, I think, uh, at the minute, and that stagnation seems like the more likely outcome, which is why I suspect that rates are probably near their peak, but then stay at that uh, relatively higher level for some time until we see that near-term inflation momentum coming off. When you meet with your US colleagues and they talk about the difference between the US and Europe right now, Catherine, can you run us through the unique underpinnings of Eurozone inflation and why it might lead to 
a period of stagflation. Do you think that's underappreciated at all? Well, I think one thing we have to acknowledge is there is a war on the doorstep of Europe and further negative supply shocks are definitely plausible. Um, and it may not be the base case, but I think it, it would be premature to, to rule them out entirely. And so Europe is is exposed in, in this way that the U.S. is, is not uh, it exposed in the same way. So, so that's one thing. I think a second... Um, Point as well is that you know throughout this period inflation has been high everywhere including US and euro area but really the primary drivers have been quite different in the US it's really coming from a very strong domestic economy so in some ways that's easier to ad address through domestic policy via what the treasury is doing with fiscal what the fed is doing on monetary policy in europe a big driver of inflation has been energy that is not within the gift of the ECB to control what's happening to wholesale energy prices. So it's a more difficult task, I think, for the central bank there. And then, of course, the ECB, uh, you know, is ever present having to deal with the potential of fragmentation risks. That, too, I think, sets it apart from the U.S. So I, I think it's just more of a challenge in, in the euro area to um, get us back to a, a steady state. Catherine, if we could do just a little bit more scenario analysis, if you will, if we went into a period of stagflation in Europe, would this central bank be constrained by the fact that it has a single mandate, inflation? And how would you play that through the bond market? Could you just give me an idea of how you think about that kind of dynamic? So the ECB's uh, remit is is different from from the Fed. They they don't have the dual mandate as as you said. So you know they're they're really only focused on price stability. They can choose how price stability is is obtained, and their independence is enshrined in 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 the treaty. So you know in a lot of ways. People do say the ECB is probably one of the most independent central banks out there in terms of the governance framework. And that, of course, will be reflected in, in the choices that, that, that they are making in terms of policy. Um, you know, but I think that said, recently, you know, there was a, a bit of a wobble from the central banks, but I think both the Fed and the ECB have done a good job in terms of taking back control of the inflation narrative. And markets are much more confident now that uh, rates are near their peak and that central banks are going to deliver on their inflation targets uh, over the medium term. And that's going to help reduce volatility and, and continue to support more generally uh, this pickup in the search for yield that we've been seeing more recently. Catherine, thank you for being with us going into this ECB decision. Catherine Nice there of PGM Fixed Income. The ECB about 20 minutes away, at least. Uh, the prospect of stagflation in, in Europe is going to be a much, much bigger conversation, particularly if inflation remains as sticky as it has been in the Eurozone. And you raise a great distinction between the U.S. and Europe, with Europe having a single mandate and the uh, if U.S. is Fed having a dual mandate. At what point do they start to question whether they're actually effectively bringing down inflation with monetary policy. Again, how much do we have to ask? Have we lost the transmission of some of these policies after so many years of terming out debt into very low rate types of instruments? Well, Europe specifically much more highly dependent on the banking channel. And given the data that we've had recently in the bank lending survey, you'd have to believe that that would hit growth and then bring down inflation. We've certainly seen it hit growth. <laughs> At the moment, we're waiting for to see if it brings inflation down in a sustainable way. And this where is where perhaps the pandemic distortions come into play because the labor shifts and some of the demands on the wage side have challenged how quickly inflation can come down, which is the reason why the Bank of England has had the incredibly unsavory uh, type of view to say, just stop asking for raises. And that hit like a bag of How life. do you think that went down? How do you think that, <laughs> Come I mean, on, honestly, what the way, are they the way economists have talked about this inflation problem is just, it doesn't resonate with the public. You saw actually Fed Chair Powell 
understand that. And yesterday saying, we actually like it when wages increase more than the underlying inflation because he didn't want to be cast in the same kind of tone that we could see the Bank of England officials being cast in when they say things like, just stop asking for And that's the real dream, isn't it? You want stable prices, but you want the pay rise. That, that's... That's Basically, yes. Dream. Of course. You're going to take this personal dream. 100%. Hey, you know, let's make it personal. It's personal for everyone. James Athey of Aberdeen on the European Central Bank joining us next. The ECB decision just around a corner, expecting another 25 basis point hike. I would say it is certainly possible that we would raise funds again at the September meeting if the data warranted. I think the Fed's going to have to be, you know, tighter for longer. The good news we've gotten on inflation recently further emboldens the Fed to actually get to that 2% target. This seems to have been very carefully put together so as not to send a dovish message. I'm not exactly sure why they paused and why they hiked and what they're going to do next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. The ECB coming up next. President Lagarde expected to hike 25 basis points. That decision is 15 minutes away. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market is positive by 0.6% on the S&P. Meta has been up in the pre-market by anywhere between 8 and 9% through much of this morning. Royal Caribbean, cruise line operator... The fifth best performing stock on the S&P 500 so far year to date. That name is up by more than 100 percent. Came out with earnings just moments ago, raising the full year guidance. And listen to this new range. Full year adjusted EPS, $6 to $6.20. The previous forecast, Lisa, $4.40 to $4.80. That is a big upgrade. Which is the reason why you're seeing uh, the stock uh, surge higher. It had been higher much more. It has come off uh, some of the earlier highs. Here's the question. How much longer can consumers keep spending on vacation? Is this a secular shift? We also saw Hertz earnings earlier this morning beating uh, expectations, even though used car prices were falling off because people are paying crazy prices. Have you rented a car recently? It's really high. It's gone up significantly and people are still paying them so at what point do people run out of cash it was supposed to be now it's not happening beat and raise royal caribbean all over the place the least point the stock is up by nine percent but you've touched on the most important theme discretionary spending away from tech we talk about tech all the time discretionary spending has been a massive theme for this year the airlines are up big something like 40 percent plus for some of them american united delta the cruise line operators three of the top performing 10 stocks on the S&P 500, Royal Caribbean, Carnival. There's two of them. There was a third in there as well at one point. Lisa, those names have been flying all year. Does that last beyond the summer? And as we get to the back end of the year, as things like student loan repayments resume, do we take that hit to discretionary spending that a lot of people are expecting? And if we don't, then that inflation story, that inflation story starts to bite back and we have a very different conversation about the Federal Reserve. And if we do see that start to fall off, then all of a sudden is recession back on the table as a whole concept of soft landing, not as preeminent, which raises this really odd tension at a moment where the Fed was embracing the soft landing, saying we are seeing strength and this is a good thing and inflation should still fall off and we're not sure, but we may not have to raise rates again. Is there an inherent conflict here as we look at all of these earnings come out that show that consumers have not yet run out of cash? They're still willing to pay prices that are substantially higher. Which is why you hear the chairman in the news conference yesterday aggressively trying to retain optionality. Yeah, Acknowledging the improvement, but at the same time saying, who knows, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do next. And that's going to be the game for the rest of the summer, isn't it? I love that. That was the most diplomatic thing I've ever heard you say, John. Maintaining maximum optionality. This is the words Don't of saying... Don't accuse me of being diplomatic. <laughs> this is the words of basically saying he said nothing and he's going to do whatever he's going to do and they're not giving forward guidance. And that's basically what we saw yesterday. Maximum optionality indeed. Basically... You know, we could raise. Back in the saddle. Not. Isn't that what Mike Apen said? What was that quote? Back in the saddle <laughs> with maximum optionality. Something that like was, that. That was Mike Apen of Bank of America. Let's turn to the price action on the S&P 500, up by 0.7% on the S&P. In the bond market, yields unchanged at 387. Lisa went through the economic data that you can expect a little bit later. We get GDP. We get jobless claims. Labor market's going to be a big focus, of course, Lisa, because at the moment, unemployment's at 3.5%. 
claims. We had the right kind of downside surprise last week on jobless claims. I mean, much better than expected. Doesn't scream recession right now, looking at some of those indicators. It doesn't even scream any kind of softening in the labor market, which was something that the Fed has said that they wanted. Yesterday, though, we heard a different tone from the central bank. We heard that maybe they could get to some sort of decline in inflation without losing jobs. I mean, we've gone to the no pain type of scenario, which brings us to Jackson Hole. Are we going to hear any kind of resurrection of we need to take pain? This is going to be rough. And oh, yeah, it's eight minutes. I'm going to go. I mean, is that what we're going to hear this time around? I haven't seen that pain, have we? I imagine it's going to be a very different address if we get one. Based on his comments yesterday, maybe he doesn't turn up to do a speech at Jackson Hole. He <laughs> didn't seem too interested. The runway for the rest of the week, the ECB in 10 minutes' time. After you get that decision, 30 minutes later, we'll have the news conference. We'll take that here on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. Overnight into tomorrow, the BOJ. That's the central banking trilogy of the week. The Fed yesterday, the ECB, then the BOJ. Then on to next week, it's the Bank of England. Joining us now for a preview of the ECB, James Athey, Investment Director at Aberdeen. James, much harder decision for the Governing Council and the European Central Bank. The Fed has the luxury of saying growth is good. The labour market's strong. Right now, I'm not sure President Lagarde can go into that news conference a little bit later this hour, James, and say growth is good. Is this a hard one for her? Hey, hey John, I mean, you, you could argue it's a little bit easier because, again, these, uh, the, the transmission for monetary policy to influence inflation is largely via demand. So, if anything, the ECB is facing a slightly easier task because they can see that demand and forward demand through things like the bank lending survey are already softening and softening significantly, which suggests that their policy is further into restrictive territory and maybe they can more um, convincingly consider the end. Whereas, you know, as you guys were just discussing, if the U.S. consumer doesn't die down, if the U.S. labor market doesn't soften, it's difficult to believe that they've found equilibrium and it, and it feels like they would have to come back to the table. So the communication is difficult because we're moving from this very backward-looking policy stance into something highly data-dependent. Central bankers know that markets have a tendency to get carried away and, and they don't want that easing of financial conditions. But that's a problem they cannot really resolve. I, I think we'll see a very similar outcome today. Non-committal, not really full of information. Meanwhile, we've been talking about the bank lending transmission mechanism in Europe, and John rightly pointed out that it is more sensitive uh, to uh, this type of contraction, which we've heard and we've seen. What are you experiencing? What are you seeing on the ground in terms of how quickly credit is contracting in the euro region? Well, I mean, that's yeah, difficult to say on the ground. I think we all have to rely on, on the data as we see it. And I look at the contents of, of the bank lending survey, and I think more pertinently on the demand side than the supply side. You know, of course, uh, supply conditions matter. They always do. But what matters for judging the stance of and transmission of monetary policy is more about the demand for loans. And we can see that that really does look incredibly soft across the Eurozone. If you look at the sort of pre-pandemic estimates for neutral rates in Europe and the US, maybe half a percent in the, in the Eurozone and maybe two and a half percent in the US, there's 200 basis points between them. But actually, there's only 100, 150 basis points uh, between the, the cash rates. So that alone suggests that European policy is already tighter uh, than US policy. And, and I do think we see that in the data. And that's without even getting to the structural challenges in the Eurozone. We've got to talk about some of those challenges now on the ground in Frankfurt, Germany. Bloomberg's Maria Tadao outside of the ECB headquarters. Maria, just frame how difficult this is going to be for the European Central Bank in 30 minutes' time for President Lagarde when she has to deliver that news conference. Well, this is going to be a very difficult communications exercise for the head of the European Central Bank because on the one hand, we know they will hike 25 basis points. That was the guidance to the market and everyone is well calibrated for that. But the big question is what happens next? And you've talked about this range of data, some of it very soft when you look at the PMIs. And it wasn't just Germany this week. You also had significant uh, downturns coming also from economies like France. We also had that London survey, which we know they look at, but then core inflation sticky. So again, the market will be focused on any guidance, any bias potentially in this decision, but I'm not sure they want to do that. If anything, the European Central Bank, you could argue, wants to go for the most neutral possible, the most options open. Look at the data. Say we go back to VM, very data dependent, and look back in September where we are. So I think it's going to be a tricky exercise. There will be a lot of questions to try to get an indication of where they want to go, but I'm not sure she wants to do that yet. You follow the speakers. We heard from Klaus Gannott 
of the Netherlands recently in the last couple of weeks, the individual members of the governing council, the traditional hawks, Maria, do you sense from them that even they are unsure about what comes next after July? Uh, yeah, and remember, uh, Jonathan, this was presented today, July, as a, quote, necessity for the central bank. When it comes to September, we've seen maybe it's now 50-50, maybe it's now an open call, maybe we need to look at the data again. They're waiting for new projections in September. So I think there's been a, almost a rethinking uh, over the past two weeks. What I'm also curious to hear about is, and this will be, I'm sure, a question, is this idea of rate cuts potentially earlier than expected. That would be the worst-case scenario for the central bank, to have inflation that is above target and get all this chit-chat in markets about potentially, because of the state of the economy, cutting beforehand. I'm also very curious as to see, can she shut it down and how will she push back against that idea? We're about five minutes away from that ECB rate decision. Still with us, James Athey of Aberdeen. And James, I'd love your take on the data dependency, the maximum optionality that we're hearing, certainly from the Fed, and as Maria was suggesting, from the ECB uh, coming up as well. What data are you honed in on? Are you going to be trading more aggressively on data in a new way? Yeah, I mean, that's unfortunately the game of investing. It, it really is John, uh, John Maynard Keynes' beauty contest. Much as I would like to look more heavily at the, the most forward-looking data, the fact of the matter is that the markets are still somewhat focused on the most lagging indicators, that's jobs and inflation. So I think some balance between the two is probably the right path to tread. I agree with Maria completely. The ECB really doesn't want to give a strong signal one way or the other. Uh, there is definitely persistent weakness across the manufacturing sector. That's much more significant in the Eurozone than it is in the US. We're now starting to see softening in the service sector as well, and that, that is good news. But, of course, none of these central banks want to box them in. You know, to nick John's words, they want maximum optionality. So some sort of obfuscation, constructional, uh, constructive ambiguity is what we're likely to see. I think once these risk events are out of the way, the market at the moment is in the mood to then run with the themes and the trades that it wanted to run with anyway. So I think we saw that in the US last night. Weaker dollar risk on probably lower yields for the summer. That's what I'm expecting. And I don't expect uh, Madame Lagarde to, to necessarily put a hole in that this afternoon. Do you expect the dollar to weaken and the euro to strengthen because of the US or because of Europe's actions? Well, I think the, the dollar is weakening because it's become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The market always has a bias to want a weaker dollar because risk tends to perform better in a weak dollar environment. The market has been and continues to love the carry trade. That generally involves at least selling dollar as an intermediate step. But I look at the dynamics currently and it doesn't necessarily look like a weak dollar environment to me. US rates are higher than European rates. The European data is rolling over far more quickly. Uh, as a general rule, that looks like a reasonably uh, solid dollar environment versus the euro. So we're marginally long the dollar here. We think already the market's got a little bit overexcited. But short term, as I say, the market tends to run with the themes it wants to. I think positioning is <laughs> a bigger headwind, a bigger headwind medium term. Well, it's you see what you that, want, James. right? I uh, know. It's yeah, always the exactly. way. Everybody sees what they want to. It's always the way. James, I just wonder, I know what investors want. They'd like a big easing program out of China. Do you think that's what policymakers on the governing council would like to see right now? Would that be welcomed by them? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I'm not sure there's necessarily a huge supply side stimulus from China easing aggressively. So that might actually complicate their picture, add to demand without an offset via supply. I think, I think the central bank would like to see inflation closer to 2% by hook or by crook. And then they can worry about the balance between supply and demand and how, how stimulatory or how restrictive their policy is. For what it's worth, I don't think China's going to engage in the sort of massive stimulus we've seen in 2015, 16 or 2007 and 8. I think there's a lot of adjustment and fiddling around the edges. I don't think they're going to go back to, to the sort of debt funded infrastructure investment stimulus that we've seen historically. So I don't think there's a massive um, impulse for Europe uh, coming from China. So far, lots of people would agree with you. We are about 60 seconds away from that ECB rate decision. Before I get to that, I think we've got to talk about the prospect of a European central bank hiking into stagflation. We have a situation at the moment where inflation has a five handle where the economy in Germany is in recession and we're having a conversation about 50 seconds time, Lisa, about another interest rate hike at the European Central Bank. It's a much tougher environment 
I think, at the moment for the ECB compared to the Federal Reserve, which is facing a situation of growth, which is still OK, unemployment, which is still low, and inflation, which is heading in the right direction. And that's the reason why, as Maria was saying and James was agreeing, they're probably going to have a similar type of tone of, say, very little and maintain maximum optionality as they try to chart forward. How does the market play that? as we do get data points, do the data really start to take on new significance, John? I'm not going to take credit for maximum optionality because I'm pretty sure I just ripped that off Mike Gapen of Bank of America. <laughs> I said aggressively retain maximum optionality, which is just the flavor of Gapen from, from B of A. The decision is seconds away. Sometimes it comes out a little bit later, a little bit after 15 minutes past the hour. We're looking for a 50, 25 basis point hike rather, and you get a 25 basis point hike from the European Central Bank. The main refinancing rate goes from 4% to 425. The marginal lending facility goes from 425 to 450 and the deposit rate goes from 350 to 375 so a 25 basis point hike from the ECB as widely expected Lisa's going to go through the various headlines and work through the statement over the next couple of seconds I just want to work through the markets just briefly give you the knee-jerk response reaction to this information two-year yields in Germany lower by three basis points the 10-year is down by about three basis points as well the reaction for the single currency not a big one at the moment the euro against the dollar euro dollar about 111.25 on the session positive by a third of one percent and just coming back just a touch Lisa what do you see that the ECB coming out, it's saying that inflation is still expected to remain too high for too long. So really doubling down on that, saying that they will continue to follow a data-dependent approach. There's that maximum optionality potentially. We'll see uh, more. They said also that inflation will further over uh, the remainder of the year. Basically, the goal here is to ensure that rates are sufficiently restrictive. This ends up becoming a question around what does sufficiently restrictive mean at a time when this same body, the ECB is saying that inflation is expected to stay above target for an extended period of time. Is that meaning that there still is sufficiently restrictive rates if you do have inflation that still is too high, John? Just want to work through the statement for you, the full body of that statement. Just a couple of quotes to share with you all. The developments since the last meeting support the expectation that inflation will drop further over the remainder of the year, but will stay above target for an extended period. While some measures show signs of easing, underlying inflation remains high overall. All. The past rate increases continue to be transmitted forcefully. Financing conditions have tightened again and are increasingly dampening demand, which is an important factor in bringing inflation back to target. I think there's a subtle nod there, Lisa, about the tightening financial conditions in the bank lending survey and endorsing it in many ways, welcoming it because they need to get inflation back towards target. It's by design. That is the goal, to try to reduce some of this credit lending. Some of the questions for Christine Lagarde, I'm sure, will be, is that enough? What does that do for them in terms of suggesting how far that transmission mechanism is moving forward? Right now, looking at the euro, not getting that much of a reaction, really, this is going to be in the statement and in her answers to questions that are going to try to get some kind of guide forward that she probably won't give. A slightly weaker euro off the back of it, just about holding on to 111 at the moment. That currency pair is now positive, just 0.2%. Around the decision when it dropped, it was positive by a third. Just on future ECB decisions, the Governing Council's future decisions will ensure that the key ECB interest rates will be set at sufficiently restricted levels for as long as necessary to achieve a timely return of inflation to the 2% medium target. The Governing Council will continue to follow a data-dependent approach to determining the appropriate level and duration of restriction. In particular, its interest rate decisions will continue to be based on its assessment of the inflation outlook in light of the incoming economic data, etc., etc., the financial data, the dynamics of underlying inflation and the strength of monetary policy transmission. Maria today over in Frankfurt with a chance to read through a lot of this. Maria, your thoughts on what we've just heard? Yeah, and, and you see a little reaction because a lot of this is by the book. We're expecting this, and the European Central Bank had really guided uh, that they would hike 25 basis points. Today, when you look at some of the language in the statement, I mean, we've seen this before. They do go back to being data dependent, but again, we were expecting that. Uh, they also talk about sufficiently restrictive. Again, the question is, when do you go into, we've done enough, so the lag is just uh, uh, the key now. We don't need to do more. And I think, to me, the real takeaway, however, is there is no indication about September. There's little guidance in the statement, which 
again reinforces the importance of this press conference. And again, the mistake perhaps or the biggest risk for uh, Madame Lagarde going into this press conference is that the market perhaps could tilt one way or another if indeed they want optionality, but there's a perception that there is a tilting in, 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 in a bias here. So if they want to keep options open, she's going to have to thread this very carefully with the language and the tone that she uses. How could she justify, Maria, not hiking further if inflation remains as sticky as it is? I mean, it's a fairly simple question, given that core inflation is five and a half percent and their one mandate is to bring down inflation. Yeah, it is a single mandate central bank. And of course, they look at headline inflation that cools down as soon as energy prices go down. But we know they focus on core inflation that is stick at 5.5 percent. So not a lot has changed on that. I think the fundamental question, and this is the biggest intellectual debate that is going on in this bank, has to do with the transmission. It takes, and we know there's a lack between what you do now and the implications that you see in the economy, not just headline inflation, but also core inflation and dynamics there. They want to be able to see or make sure that what they've done will be enough or maybe it's not enough and that's why September is still at play that's why she'll justify we need to hike today that was a necessity but the future path this is unclear uh, probably it's going to be an open call going into this meeting and again you do see that with the weak PMIs that we saw this week that London survey to the trade-off between the economy and inflation becomes ever more difficult for the central bank hi Maria thank you and I've got a news conference to get into we appreciate your time Maria today there over at ECPHQ at the headquarters of the European Central Bank. That news conference starts in about 24 minutes' time for Christine Lagarde and the ECB president. If you are just tuning in, welcome. 25 basis point hike from the ECB and rather like the Federal Reserve offering very little guidance about the future. The phrase of the last 24 hours sort of fed maximum optionality. I think that phrase, of course, applicable to the ECB this morning based on what we've heard so far. The euro selling off a little bit following the decision. Near session lows, the euro still just about positive. A break of 111, though, at 110.98. We roll over there. A rally in the bond market in Germany. The two-year yield there is now lower by eight basis points to about 3% on a German two-year. James Athey of Aberdeen back with us for a little bit more. James, just some thoughts on this decision. Do you get the feeling, and I wonder if this is endorsed in the news conference, that this ECB is starting to put more weight on the growth data and maybe a little less, just respectively, relatively speaking, on the inflation data? Yeah, I do, John, and I think that's absolutely right. It was the early phase of this process was very much a case of central banks just being in completely the wrong ballpark. They had monetary policy, which was effectively easier than, you know, five, six, seven years of, of low growth, low inflation. And they were staring down the barrel of, you know, this wild money growth and incredible inflation dynamic. So those first six, nine, 12 months were very much about catching up. But the later you get into that process, the later we get into the cycle, the more they have to be looking out of the front window and less looking out of the rear window. Because as yourselves and, and Maria have just said, we know that these policies operate with lags. The transmissions are not well understood. You know, economists don't really like to admit this stuff, but our understanding of this complex machinery is very partial indeed. And so, you know, at some stage you have to try and balance the various considerations, even if you just have an inflation mandate. Because again, the only way that monetary policy can influence inflation is the very blunt way of, of being a headwind to demand. And so it is natural and reasonable when you think you're getting closer to the end of that process to start to consider forward inflation, to cut, start to consider your forecasts for inflation to a greater degree than data released today, which tells you more about where policy was a year ago. Right now we're seeing a little reaction, although on the margins you are seeing a rally in German bonds and you're hearing, uh, as John mentioned, a bit of a softening in the euro versus the initial reaction versus the dollar. Is this enough to really get you a sense that this is a more dovish or less hawkish ECB and give you confidence to even lean into European sovereign bonds a little bit more? I think the problem, Lisa, is that 
a data dependent means that my forecasts for the economic data probably matter more than my assessment of the reaction function of the committee of the individuals on the committee I did think and again this was something you guys mentioned earlier I did think that the speech by class not was really significant because he's been a dyed in the wool hawk and he really did elucidate this idea of the risks of policy error shifting more and more towards the hawkish error I think that's very relevant information but if we're all wrong about the inflation outlook and core inflation goes from five and a half to six not five and a half to five then it's no use that we thought that the ECB was evolving in a dovish direction today and that is why there has been such a tricky market environment because actually the economic data itself has been rather volatile and rather difficult to explain through a kind of all-encompassing macro lens. James. That being said, medium term, I do expect it to slow. We've got about 60 seconds. If you could, a question for Lagarde in this news conference for the press. James, what would it be? I knew, I knew you were going to ask me that, so I was thinking so about a prepared. question for Madame Lagarde. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was thinking I would ask her about the balance sheet because it occurs to me that you know, lots of central banks think the balance sheet is magic. It, it's a wonderful stimulus on the way up and it's completely inert on the way down. But if the ECB really is still concerned about inflation, why it is that they refuse to engage with the idea of PEP reinvestments because they've just confirmed they will continue to go on year after year. And to me, that still feels a rather strange situation to be in. Interesting. We've known each other so long that I'm that predictable these days. James Athey of Aberdeen. James, thank you, buddy, as always. Here's the guidebook, the runway, through the next 10 minutes or so. So in five minutes' time, you'll get some economic data in America. We'll get some GDP numbers, initial jobless claims, all of that good stuff. Lisa and Mike McKee will break that down. They'll be caught up with, uh, they'll be catching up with Vince Reinhardt of BNY Mellon Asset Management. So look out for that conversation. Going through the opening bell after that news conference wraps up, it will start, by the way, with President Lagarde in 20 minutes' time. We'll come out the other side and break it down with Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites and Peter Chair of Academy Securities. All of that still to come. Data in America in just a moment. A press conference with Christine Lagarde starting in 20 minutes' time. And an equity market that's elevated through most of this morning. We're positive by 0.7%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. 15 minutes away from Christine Lagarde's press conference following raising rates by 25 basis points at the ECB, just seconds away from a slew of U.S. economic data, including the second quarter at GDP reading, as well as initial jobless claims at a time when the Federal Reserve and the ECB likely will be looking to maintain maximum optionality. In other words, they're not going to predict what they are going to do next. Right now in markets, you are seeing the Nasdaq leading the gains up almost one and a half percent following the results from Meta. We're seeing a bit of stability in bond markets. Yields just slightly higher uh, with 10-year yields at 3.88 percent as all of this data does come in. Right now, let's head over to our own Michael McKee for a breakdown. Mike. Good morning, Lisa. We've got a lot of numbers for you here, and it's a better than expected GDP report for the second quarter. This is going to have uh, the Fed changing some of its forecasts, 2.4 percent, which was what the Atlanta Fed GDP now yesterday said would we would see. 1.6 percent personal consumption. That's down from 4.2 percent in the final revision to the first quarter GDP. So maybe that gets revised up. Uh, core PCE, uh, uh, the price index, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's do price indexes here. 2.2% on the quarter uh, for the headline and 3.8% for the core. Now, jobless claims, if this is at all possible, they are still falling. 221,000 last week, 228,000. Continuing claims, 1,690,000. That's down from 1,749,000. So not as many people getting jobless claims, not as many people filing for initial jobless claims. Durable goods orders come up in up 4.7% after a 2% gain in the month of, of May. And capital goods orders, non-defense, ex-air, sort of the core of this up two-tenths of a percent. That's after a five-tenths gain the month before. Shipments were flat during June, which is kind of interesting given the strength that we see in GDP. Uh, Lisa, I'll let you check the markets because I'm trying to get the latest GDP numbers and see what the breakdown is and how this all worked out.
I'll let you do that. Right now, what we are seeing is not a lot of drama, but we are seeing yields shift upward, particularly at the front end, by a couple basis points as people parse through what this better than expected data means. You are seeing uh, stocks retain their gains. Again, not a massive reaction, uh, especially given the earnings that have been stronger than expected. The euro weaker versus the dollar, continuing that trend, 110.75 after the ECB came out and raised rates by 25 basis points. But after this stronger than expected, U.S. data, that to me is probably the biggest mover uh, with a decline of about a tenth of percent, the euro falling versus the dollar. Mike, you've had a second to really parse through some of this. And I do want to ask you whether this kind of raises a question about whether the Fed can have its cake and eat it too. Stronger than expected growth. Yet when you take a look and you dig under the hood, it looks like the price index came in more than expected. Jobless claims coming in, basically Goldilocks. Uh, I would uh, quote Jay Powell and say I'm reluctant to uh, use that word at this point, but it does suggest the U.S. economy remains strong, retains some strength, even at uh, five and a quarter percent uh, Fed funds rate. The uh, consumer spending was interesting because it falls to 1.6 percent, but uh, that got revised up twice uh, in the first quarter. So that might be revised higher. Business fixed investment, business spending really jumps. It was negative in the first quarter. It was up 4.9% uh, overall. Uh, Non-residential fixed investment, which is kind of uh, business spending, 7.7% led by structures up 9.7%. We knew that was happening. And equipment, 10.8%. So businesses went out and spent a lot of money during the month, and that is good news for the overall economy. Uh, looking at uh, the rest of this, uh, I've got to scroll down here to inventories uh, and see what, uh, see what happened with yeah. inventories. Um, let's see if I can find it right here. Um, not finding it well, immediately. Mike. Why don't we? Why don't you take a minute to parse through all of the data? It's been a massive amount of uh, numbers, and we'll get back to you in just a little bit. Right now, I really want to get through what we're looking at in terms of is it a soft landing or is it a head fake? And I'm pleased to say uh, that we're joined by Vincent Reinhardt, chief economist and macro strategist at Dreyfus and Mellon. Vincent, what's your take on the slew of data that we just got that really highlights both a soft landing and, on the margins, disinflation? We probably heard heard it from Chair Powell yesterday. Importantly, he said that the board staff had taken out their forecast of a recession. And Mike noted that GDP wasn't a surprise to the Atlanta Fed that had a, an estimated 2.4 percent uh, growth this last quarter. Uh, board staff invests a lot of resources in doing the same thing. So I don't really think that this morning. Uh, in, certainly from the national income accounts, was that much of a surprise. Big question is, does it make it more or less likely there's a soft landing? Uh, sure, leans that way, but it's one data point. That's what Chair Powell would say at this point. What do you make of initial jobless claims? Second consecutive month that there's yeah. been an upside surprise, or at least a positive downside surprise. Basically, there are fewer people filing for unemployment than previously expected in the prior month. How does this confirm with the idea that we need a, a loosening labor market in order to achieve disinflation? Yeah, so the other part of soft landing is new productivity, uh, that we are getting very strong employment growth uh, that is at least matching that that and output. We're, we're, we're not gaining anything in terms of output per hour. Among other things, that means that wage gains are more serious uh, because there's no cushion between uh, what firms pay workers and what they what they produce. Uh, I think that, uh, among other things, um, you know, the, the main takeaway is uh, tight la labor market is fueling household income, and household income is supporting consumption. Which is Hard a to get a recession that way. 
Which is a reason why some people are wondering whether this is somewhat of an uncomfortable rationale that you're seeing strength in the economy, and yet the Fed is moving away from any forward guidance of further rate hikes. Do you think that this is a mistake, that there wasn't a, a greater indication to markets that the Fed did plan to raise rates again once in this particular year, considering that Rich Clarida earlier on this show said that he, if he were still on the Fed, would vote to raise rates again this fall? Uh, well, last guidance was that they would raise rates in the summary of economic projections. Chair Powell was pretty confusing. Uh, he wanted to re uh, assert very strongly that every decision is, uh, every meeting is live, that every meeting is made based on the data. Uh, but in fact, there's, there seemed to be guiding us to a slower pace of policy firm. 12 and a half basis points a meeting on average. Um, that sounds like a committee that is number one, divided, uh, and number two, pretty close to the end. Do you, uh, get, do you get the sense as you look through this data that there is strength in the economy that perhaps they're not really watching closely enough, that there does seem to be something that could reignite inflation later in the year? So I think they're watching closely the data. They see the strength in the economy. And if you're chair of Powell, you're encouraged by it. He's never really uh, had a hard hard landing in his, his outlook. Uh, I think that um, the extent that the strong data is coming from the labor market, it's got to be troubling. It's got to be reason why uh, uh, you have to lean toward more policy firming. Uh, and 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 I think it, it does pose a fundamental challenge. Are you concerned that there isn't more dissent, at least publicly, on the Federal Reserve at a time where, as you said, it was somewhat confusing and it seems as though there's a bit of a herding cats type of trend going on there? So I think we saw, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the division in the committee just by the two press conferences in a succession. In the June meeting, the chair spent a lot of time talking about all they'd done was slow the pace, uh, slowing policy, tightening, uh, uh, allows more information to gather. Uh, but this time it was it had he had it must have had a yellow sticky note on his on his talking point saying say meeting by me meeting uh, live live uh, data dependent as often as you can that suggests to me that he wants a slow pace of policy firming so he's got optionality may may or may not tighten in November but he's got enough restive colleagues saying. Uh, nope, every meeting is live. Go out there and remind everybody every meeting is live. That That's a division in the committee. We'll see probably better in, in three weeks when we get the minutes. In about five minutes' time, we'll get uh, maybe a sense of what's on the uh, sticky note, the yellow sticky note of Christine Lagarde. In the meantime, I do want to head back to Michael McKee, who's been parsing through all of the data. Mike, what stands out to you in the details, the fine line items underpinning GDP, underpinning durable goods. Well, GDP, the interesting thing here is we've seen a couple of months where inventories and trade really affected the numbers, but not in the second quarter. They both subtracted about a tenth of a percent uh, from the overall number. They kind of offset each other. And uh, the real strength was in business spending up 1 percent and consumer spending up 1.1 percent. So that makes up most of what we saw during the uh, second quarter. And it does suggest strength. Government consumption was up 2.6%. Uh, uh, that's down from 5% in the uh, previous quarter. Uh, Non-defense spending, which was up 10.5% in this uh, first quarter, was down 1.1%. So not a huge contribution from the government this time. It's consumers and business spending, uh, the C and I part of C plus I plus G plus NX. Uh, and in terms of uh, durable goods, it's just overall good news that uh, there is some spending, but it did slow in the capital goods non-defense area. So we'll see what kind of contribution that we get from durable goods when we go into the next month. I think the Fed looks at uh, today's numbers and has to, obviously has to change their forecast for GDP for the year at the September meeting. And uh, the jobless claims numbers uh, just tell the Fed that we're not going to see uh, unemployment start to rise uh, in the near future. So they may have to adjust those as well. 
And this is the kind of report, I guess, that keeps them on alert, not going to make them make a decision, because we're a long way away from September 21st, but uh, keeps them on alert for the possibility of having to raise rates again. Thank you so much, Mike. Great synopsis there, especially as we start to see uh, increasing momentum or at least stability in the consumer. Vincent Reinhardt still with us. Vincent, how long can consumers keep spending like this at a time where we're seeing results from the likes of Hertz, from the likes of Royal Caribbean? That trend is still in place. Uh, so a couple things. They still have the retained uh, uh, fiscal transfers they got in 2020 and 2021. They've worked down a lot of that mound, but they still have that saving. Uh, and second is we're generating jobs and wage growth is, is, is strong. That means they're getting household income. Two points to what Mike said. I actually see a lot of the government in the GDP print, and that's, that's incentives to for capital spending. I think that's part of the reason capital spending was so strong, uh, given all the green initiatives. Second thing, inventory is on the soft side. The closest relationship of business loans to economic activity is the inventory component. So some of the softening in bank lending we've seen might actually be demand, not, not supply and credit constriction. And that's what we've seen over in Europe as well. It was a drop off in demand, not necessarily on the supply side. As you parse through this, though, are you watching things like the student loan repayments? Is that going to really play a role or is it really going to have to come from uh, some, I guess, tightening further in a way that might be a little more disorderly? Uh, so I think it's got to it's got to be the latter. Uh, i.e., uh, at this stage in the monetary transmission mechanism, it's the credit constriction that Jay Powell is waiting for. Uh, it is going to be, uh, uh, you know, the the cumulative toll of the earlier bank runs. And all, and by the way, quantitative tightening is actually starting in earnest only now. First year of the program, when the tre when the Fed ran off its security securities holdings, the Treasury paid for it by working down its cash balance at the Fed. Just moved money from one pocket of the government to another. Uh, now, with the Treasury keeping its cash balance at a high level, all the the re security redemptions the Fed is 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 doing is going to be coming out of the assets the private sector holds. We're so, just. Uh, Quantitative tightening is really kicking in now. We're just minutes away from uh, Christine Lagarde giving a press conference. It's scheduled to be 845. However, there usually are a lot of photos and introductions, so it may be a couple minutes after that. Vincent Reinhardt with us of Dreyfus and Mellon. And inevitably, one of the questions that Christine Lagarde will field will be oil prices gas prices, how that affects the outlook, how that affects inflation, how that affects their role. As uh, we talk about that, we're seeing oil prices climb to the highest levels going back to April uh, and climbing, uh, hitting $80 a barrel for the first time since then. Vincent, how does potentially higher oil prices, higher energy prices more broadly, affect a debate that has really been supported, the disinflation by lower energy prices? Much harder for Christine Lagarde to answer that question than Jay Powell, because the, the U.S. is is an energy balance. We're actually net ex energy exporter uh, for the European economy, an enormous energy importer. In which case, an oil price shock is just nothing but bad. It adds to cost, but it also pulls out income from domestic res from residents. Uh, to the foreign sector, uh, that uh, a, a good portion, as you note, of the favorable inflation dynamics at the headline level uh, over the last six months has been the decline in commodity prices generally, energy specifically, and the repair of the goods market. Repair of the goods market is continuing yeah. in, in the sense of uh, uh, supply chains getting better. But the reversal of energy prices uh, is going to add to cost in Europe and is going to hit hit demand through income. Vincent Reinhardt of Dreyfus and Mellon, thank you so much uh, for being with us.